Chapter eighteen of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter eighteen. Language of metrical composition. Why and wherein essentially different from that of prose. Origin and elements of metre its necessary consequences and the conditions thereby imposed on the metrical writer in the choice of his diction i conclude therefore that the attempt is impracticable and that were it not impracticable it would still be useless for the very power of making the selection implies the previous possession of the language selected or where can the poet have lived and by what rules could he direct his choice which would not have enabled him to select and arrange his words by the light of his own judgment we do not adopt the language of a class by the mere adoption of such words exclusively as that class would use or at least understand but likewise by following the order in which the words of such men are wont to succeed each other now this order in the intercourse of uneducated men is distinguished from the diction of their superiors in knowledge and power by the greater disjunction and separation in the component parts of that whatever it be which they wish to communicate there is a want of that prospectiveness of mind that serve you which enables a man to foresee the whole of what he is to convey appertaining to any one point and by this means so to subordinate and arrange the different parts according to their relative importance as to convey it at once and as an organized whole now i will take the first stanza on which i have chanced to open in the lyrical ballads it is one the most simple and the least peculiar in its language in distant countries have i been and yet i have not often seen a healthy man a man full-grown weep in the public roads alone but such a one on english ground and in the broad highway i met along the broad highway he came his cheeks with tears were wet sturdy he seemed though he was sad and in his arms a lamb he had the words here are doubtless such as are current in all ranks of life and of course not less so in the hamlet and cottage than in the shop manufactory college or palace but is this the order in which the rustic would have placed the words i am grievously deceived if the following less compact mode of commencing the same tale be not a far more faithful copy i have been in a many parts far and near and i don't know that i ever saw before a man crying by himself in the public road a grown man i mean that was neither sick nor hurt etc etc but when i turn to the following stanza in the thorn at all times of the day and night this wretched woman thither goes and she is known to every star and every wind that blows and there beside the thorn she sits when the blue daylight's in the skies and when the whirlwind's on the hill or frosty air is keen and still and to herself she cries o misery o misery o woe is me o misery and compare this with the language of ordinary men or with that which i can conceive at all likely to proceed in real life from such a narrator as is supposed in the note to the poem compare it either in the succession of the images or of the sentences i am reminded of the sublime prayer and hymn of praise which milton in opposition to an established liturgy presents as a fair specimen of common extemporary devotion and such as we might expect to hear from every self-inspired minister of a conventicle and i reflect with delight how little a mere theory though of his own workmanship interferes with the processes of genuine imagination in a man of true poetic genius who possesses as mr wordsworth if ever man did most assuredly does possess the vision and the faculty divine one point then alone remains but that the most important its examination having been indeed my chief inducement for the preceding inquisition there neither is nor can be any essential difference between the language of prose and metrical composition such is mr wordsworth's assertion now prose itself at least in all argumentative and consecutive works differs and ought to differ from the language of conversation even as reading ought to differ from talking unless therefore the difference denied be that of the mere words as materials common to all styles of writing and not of the style itself in the universally admitted sense of the term it might be naturally presumed that there must exist a still greater between the ordinance of poetic composition and that of prose than is expected to distinguish prose from ordinary conversation there are not indeed examples wanting in the history of literature of apparent paradoxes that have summoned the public wonder as new and startling truths but which on examination have shrunk into tame and harmless truisms as the eyes of a cat seen in the dark have been mistaken for flames of fire but mr wordsworth is among the last men to whom a delusion of this kind would be attributed by any one who had enjoyed the slightest opportunity of understanding his mind and character 
where an objection has been anticipated by such an author as natural his answer to it must needs be interpreted in some sense which either is or has been or is capable of being controverted my object then must be to discover some other meaning for the term essential difference in this place exclusive of the indistinction and community of the words themselves for whether there ought to exist a class of words in the english in any degree resembling the poetic dialect of the greek and italian is a question of very subordinate importance the number of such words would be small indeed in our language and even in the italian and greek they consist not so much of different words as of slight differences in the forms of declining and conjugating the same words forms doubtless which having been at some period more or less remote the common grammatic flexions of some tribe or province had been accidentally appropriated to poetry by the general admiration of certain master intellects the first established lights of inspiration to whom that dialect happened to be native essence in its primary signification means the principle of individuation the inmost principle of the possibility of anything as that particular thing it is equivalent to the idea of a thing whenever we use the word idea with philosophic precision existence on the other hand is distinguished from essence by the superinduction of reality thus we speak of the essence and essential properties of a circle but we do not therefore assert that anything which really exists is mathematically circular thus too without any tautology we contend for the existence of the supreme being that is for a reality correspondent to the idea there is next a secondary use of the word essence in which it signifies the point or ground of contradistinction between two modifications of the same substance or subject thus we should be allowed to say that the style of architecture of westminster abbey is essentially different from that of st paul even though both had been built with blocks cut into the same form and from the same quarry only in this latter sense of the term must it have been denied by mr wordsworth for in this sense alone is it affirmed by the general opinion that the language of poetry that is the formal construction or architecture of the words and phrases is essentially different from that of prose now the burden of the proof lies with the oppugner not with the supporters of the common belief mr wordsworth in consequence assigns as the proof of his position that not only the language of a large portion of every good poem even of the most elevated character must necessarily except with reference to the metre in no respect differ from that of good prose but likewise that some of the most interesting parts of the best poems will be found to be strictly the language of prose when prose is well written the truth of this assertion might be demonstrated by innumerable passages from almost all the poetical writings even of milton himself he then quotes gray's sonnet in vain to me the smiling morning shine and reddening phoebus lifts his golden fire the birds in vain their amorous descant join or cheerful fields resume their green attire these ears alas for other notes repine a different object do these eyes require my lonely anguish melts no heart but mine and in my breast the imperfect joys expire yet morning smiles the busy race to cheer and new-born pleasure brings to happier men the fields to all their wonted tribute bear to warm their little loves the birds complain i fruitless mourn to him that cannot hear and weep the more because i weep in vain and adds the following remark it will easily be perceived that the only part of this sonnet which is of any value is the lines printed in italics it is equally obvious that except in the rhyme and in the use of the single word fruitless for fruitlessly which is so far a defect the language of these lines does in no respect differ from that of prose an idealist defending his system by the fact that when asleep we often believe ourselves awake was well answered by his plain neighbour ah but when awake do we ever believe ourselves asleep things identical must be convertible the preceding passage seems to rest on a similar sophism for the question is not whether there may not occur in prose an order of words which would be equally proper in a poem nor whether there are not beautiful lines and sentences of frequent occurrence in good poems which would be equally becoming as well as beautiful in good prose for neither the one nor the other has ever been either denied or doubted by any one the true question must be whether there are not modes of expression a construction and an order of sentences which are in their fit and natural place in a serious prose composition but would be disproportionate and heterogeneous in metrical poetry and vice versa whether in the language of a serious poem there may not be an arrangement both of words and sentences and a use and selection of what are called figures of speech both as to their kind their frequency and their occasions which on a subject of equal weight would be vicious and alien incorrect and manly prose i contend that in both cases this unfitness of each for the place of the other frequently will and ought to exist and first from the origin of metre this i would trace to the balance in the mind effected by that spontaneous effort which strives to hold in check the workings of passion it might be easily explained likewise in what manner this salutary antagonism is assisted by the very state which it counteracts 
and how this balance of antagonists became organized into metre in the usual acceptation of that term by a supervening act of the will and judgment consciously and for the foreseen purpose of pleasure assuming these principles as the data of our argument we deduce from them two legitimate conditions which the critic is entitled to expect in every metrical work first that as the elements of metre owe their existence to a state of increased excitement so the metre itself should be accompanied by the natural language of excitement secondly that as these elements are formed into metre artificially by a voluntary act with the design and for the purpose of blending delight with emotion so the traces of present volition should throughout the metrical language be proportionately discernible now these two conditions must be reconciled and co-present there must be not only a partnership but a union an interpenetration of passion and of will of spontaneous impulse and of voluntary purpose again this union can be manifested only in a frequency of forms and figures of speech originally the offspring of passion but now the adopted children of power greater than would be desired or endured where the emotion is not voluntarily encouraged and kept up for the sake of that pleasure which such emotion so tempered and mastered by the will is found capable of communicating it not only dictates but of itself tends to produce a more frequent employment of picturesque and vivifying language than would be natural in any other case in which there did not exist as there does in the present a previous and well understood though tacit compact between the poet and his reader that the latter is entitled to expect and the former bound to supply this species and degree of pleasurable excitement we may in some measure apply to this union the answer of polixenes in the winter's tale to perdita's neglect of the street gillyflowers because she had heard it said there is an art which in their piedness shares with great creating nature polixenes say there be yet nature is made better by no mean but nature makes that mean so o'er oh, that art which you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes you see sweet maid we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock and may conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race this is an art which does mend nature change it rather but the art itself is nature secondly i argue from the effects of metre as far as metre acts in and for itself it tends to increase the vivacity and susceptibility both of the general feelings and of the attention this effect it produces by the continued excitement of surprise and by the quick reciprocations of curiosity still gratified and still re-excited which are too slight indeed to be at any one moment objects of distinct consciousness yet become considerable in their aggregate influence as a medicated atmosphere or as wine during animated conversation they act powerfully though themselves unnoticed where therefore correspondent food and appropriate matter are not provided for the attention and feelings thus roused there must needs be a disappointment felt like that of leaping in the dark from the last step of a staircase when we had prepared our muscles for a leap of three or four the discussion on the powers of metre in the preface is highly ingenious and touches at all points on truth but i cannot find any statement of its powers considered abstractly and separately on the contrary mr wordsworth seems always to estimate metre by the powers which it exerts during and as i think in consequence of its combination with other elements of poetry thus the previous difficulty is left unanswered what the elements are with which it must be combined in order to produce its own effects to any pleasurable purpose double and trisyllable rhymes indeed form a lower species of wit and attended to exclusively for their own sake may become a source of momentary amusement as in poor smart's dystick to the welsh squire who had promised him a hare tell me thou son of great cadwallader hast sent the hare or hast thou swallowed her but for any poetic purposes metre resembles if the aptness of the simile may excuse its meanness yeast worthless or disagreeable by itself but giving vivacity and spirit to the liquor with which it is proportionally combined the reference to the children in the wood by no means satisfies my judgment we all willingly throw ourselves back for a while into the feelings of our childhood this ballad therefore we read under such recollections of our own childish feelings as would equally endear to us poems which mr wordsworth himself would regard as faulty in the opposite extreme of gaudy and technical ornament before the invention of printing and in a still greater degree before the introduction of writing metre especially alliterative metre whether alliterative at the beginning of the words as in piers ploughman or at the end as in rhymes possessed an independent value as assisting the recollection and consequently the preservation of any series of truths or incidents but i am not convinced by the collation of facts that the children in the wood owes either its preservation or its popularity to its metrical form mr marshall's repository affords a number of tales in prose inferior in pathos and general merit some of as old a date and many as widely popular tom hickathrift jack the giant killer goody two-shoes and little red riding hood are formidable rivals and that they have continued in prose cannot be fairly explained by the assumption 
that the comparative meanness of their thoughts and images precluded even the humblest forms of metre the scene of goody two-shoes in the church is perfectly susceptible of metrical narration and among the thaumata thaumastatata even of the present age i do not recollect a more astonishing image than that of the whole rookery that flew out of the giant's beard scared by the tremendous voice with which this monster answered the challenge of the heroic tom hickathrift if from these we turn to compositions universally and independently of all early associations beloved and admired would the maria the monk or the poor man's ass or stern be read with more delight or have a better chance of immortality had they without any change in the diction been composed in rhyme than in their present state if i am not grossly mistaken the general reply would be in the negative nay i will confess that in mr wordsworth's own volumes the anecdote for fathers simon lee alice fell beggars and the sailor's mother notwithstanding the beauties which are to be found in each of them where the poet interposes the music of his own thoughts would have been more delightful to me in prose told and managed as by mr wordsworth they would have been in a moral essay or pedestrian tour metre in itself is simply a stimulant of the attention and therefore excites the question why is the attention to be thus stimulated now the question cannot be answered by the pleasure of the metre itself for this we have shown to be conditional and dependent on the appropriateness of the thoughts and expressions to which the metrical form is superadded neither can i conceive any other answer that can be rationally given short of this i write in metre because i am about to use a language different from that of prose besides where the language is not such how interesting soever the reflections are that are capable of being drawn by a philosophic mind from the thoughts or incidents of the poem the metre itself must often become feeble take the last three stanzas of the sailor's mother for instance if i could for a moment abstract from the effect produced on the author's feelings as a man by the instant at the time of its real occurrence i would dare appeal to his own judgment whether in the metre itself he found a sufficient reason for their being written metrically and thus continuing she said i had a son who many a day sailed on the seas but he is dead in denmark he was cast away and i have travelled far as hull to see what clothes he might have left or other property the bird and cage they both were his twas my son's bird and neat and trim he kept it many voyages this singing bird hath gone with him when last he sailed he left the bird behind as it might be perhaps from bodings of his mind he to a fellow lodger's care had left it to be watched and fed till he came back again and there i found it when my son was dead and now god help me for my little wit i trail it with me sir he took so much delight in it if disproportioning the emphasis we read these stanzas so as to make the rhymes perceptible even trisyllable rhymes could scarcely produce an equal sense of oddity and strangeness as we feel here in finding rhymes at all in sentences so exclusively colloquial i would further ask whether but for that visionary state into which the figure of the woman and the susceptibility of his own genius had placed the poet's imagination a state which spreads its influence and colouring over all that coexists with the exciting cause in which the simplest and the most familiar things gain a strange power of spreading awe around them i would ask the poet whether he would not have felt an abrupt downfall in these verses from the preceding stanza the ancient spirit is not dead old times thought i are breathing there proud was i that my country bred such strength a dignity so fair she begged an alms like one in poor estate i looked at her again nor did my pride abate it must not be omitted and is besides worthy of notice that those stanzas furnish the only fair instance that i have been able to discover in all mr wordsworth's writing of an actual adoption or true imitation of the real and very language of low and rustic life freed from provincialisms thirdly i deduce the position from all the causes elsewhere assigned which render metre the proper form of poetry and poetry imperfect and defective without metre metre therefore having been connected with poetry most often and by a peculiar fitness whatever else is combined with metre must though it be not itself essentially poetic have nevertheless some property in common with poetry as an intermedium of affinity a sort if i may dare borrow a well-known phrase from technical chemistry of mordant between it and the superadded metre now poetry mr wordsworth truly affirms does always imply passion which word must be here understood in its most general sense as an excited state of the feelings and faculties and as every passion has its proper pulse so will it likewise have its characteristic modes of expression but where there exists that degree of genius and talent which entitles a writer to aim at the honours of a poet the very act of poetic composition itself is and is allowed to imply and to produce an unusual state of excitement which of course justifies and demands a correspondent difference of language as truly though not perhaps in as marked a degree as the excitement of love fear rage or jealousy the vividness of the descriptions or declamations in dunn or dryden 
is as much and as often derived from the force and fervour of the describer as from the reflections forms or incidents which constitute their subject and materials the wheels take fire from the mere rapidity of their motion to what extent and under what modifications this may be admitted to act i shall attempt to define in an after remark on mr wordsworth's reply to this objection or rather on his objection to this reply as already anticipated in his preface fourthly and as intimately connected with this if not the same argument in a more general form i adduce the high spiritual instinct of the human being impelling us to seek unity by harmonious adjustment and thus establishing the principle that all the parts of an organized whole must be assimilated to the more important and essential parts this and the preceding arguments may be strengthened by the reflection that the composition of a poem is among the imitative arts and that imitation as opposed to copying consists either in the interfusion of the same throughout the radically different or of the different throughout a base radically the same lastly i appeal to the practice of the best poets of all countries and in all ages as authorizing the opinion deduced from all the foregoing that in every import of the word essential which would not here involve a mere truism there may be is and ought to be an essential difference between the language of prose and of metrical composition in mr wordsworth's criticism of gray's sonnet the reader's sympathy with his praise or blame of the different parts is taken for granted rather perhaps too easily he has not at least attempted to win or compel it by argumentative analysis in my conception at least the lines rejected as of no value do with the exception of the two first differ as much and as little from the language of common life as those which he has printed in italics as possessing genuine excellence of the five lines thus honourably distinguished two of them differ from prose even more widely than the lines which either proceed or follow in the position of the words a different object do these eyes require my lonely anguish melts no heart but mine and in my breast the imperfect joys expire but were it otherwise what would this prove but a truth of which no man ever doubted vide licet that there are sentences which would be equally in their place both in verse and prose assuredly it does not prove the point which alone requires proof namely that there are not passages which would suit the one and not suit the other the first line of this sonnet is distinguished from the ordinary language of men by the epithet to morning for we will set aside at present the consideration that the particular word smiling is hackneyed and as it involves a sort of personification not quite congruous with the common and material attribute of shining and doubtless this adjunction of epithets for the purpose of additional description where no particular attention is demanded for the quality of the thing would be noticed as giving a poetic cast to a man's conversation should the sportsman exclaim come boys the rosy morning calls you up he will be supposed to have some song in his head but no one suspects this when he says a wet morning shall not confine us to our beds this then is either a defect in poetry or it is not whoever should decide in the affirmative i would request him to reperuse any one poem of any confessedly great poet from homer to milton or from ischlus to shakespeare and to strike out in thought i mean every instance of this kind if the number of these fancied erasures did not startle him or if he continued to deem the work improved by their total omission he must advance reasons of no ordinary strength and evidence reasons grounded in the essence of human nature otherwise i should not hesitate to consider him as a man not so much proof against all authority as dead to it the second line and reddening phoebus lifts his golden fire has indeed almost as many faults as words but then it is a bad line not because the language is distinct from that of prose but because it conveys incongruous images because it confounds the cause and the effect the real thing with the personified representative of the thing in short because it differs from the language of good sense that the phoebus is hackneyed and a schoolboy image is an accidental fault dependent on the age in which the author wrote and not deduced from the nature of the thing that it is part of an exploded mythology is an objection more deeply grounded yet when the torch of ancient learning was rekindled so cheering were its beams that our eldest poets cut off by christianity from all accredited machinery and deprived of all acknowledged guardians and symbols of the great objects of nature were naturally induced to adopt as a poetic language those fabulous personages those forms of the supernatural in nature which had given them such dear delight in the poems of their great masters nay even at this day what scholar of genial taste will not so far sympathize with them as to read with pleasure in petrarch chaucer or spenser what he would perhaps condemn as puerile in a modern poet i remember no poet whose writings would safely stand the test of mr wordsworth's theory than spenser yet will mr wordsworth say that the style of the following stanza is either undistinguished from prose and the language of ordinary life 
or that it is vicious, and that the stanzas are blots in the fairy queen. By this the northern wagoner had set his sevenfold team behind the steadfast star, that was in ocean waves yet never wet, but firm is fixed and sendeth light from far, to all that in the wild deep wandering are, and cheerful chanticleer with his note shrill, had worn once at Phoebus' fiery car, in haste was climbing up the eastern hill, full envious that night so long his room did fill. At last the golden oriental gate, of greatest heaven, gan to open fair, and Phoebus fresh as bridegroom to his mate, came dancing forth, shaking his dewy hair, and hurled his glistering beams through gloomy air, which when the wakeful elf perceived, straightway he started up and did himself prepare, in some bright arms and battler's array, for with that pagan proud he combat will that day. On the contrary, to how many passages, both in hymn-books and in blank verse poems, could I, were it not invidious, direct the reader's attention, the style of which is most unpoetic, because, and only because, it is the style of prose. He will not suppose me capable of having in my mind such verses as, I put my hat upon my head, and walked into the strand, and there I met another man, whose hat was in his hand. To such specimens it would indeed be a fair and full reply that these lines are not bad because they are unpoetic, but because they are empty of all sense and feeling, and that it were an idle attempt to prove that an ape is not a Newton, when it is self-evident that he is not a man. But the sense shall be good and weighty, the language correct and dignified, the subject interesting and treated with feeling, and yet the style shall, notwithstanding all these merits, be justly blamable as prosaic, and solely because the words and the order of the words would find their appropriate place in prose, but are not suitable to metrical composition. The Civil Wars of Daniel is an instructive, and even interesting work. But take the following stanzas, and from the hundred instances which abound, I might probably have selected others far more striking, and to the end we may with better ease discern the true discourse vouchsafe to shew, what were the times for going near to these, that these we may with better profit know. Tell how the world fell into this disease, and how so great distemperature did grow. So shall we see with what degrees it came, how things at full do soon wax out of frame. Ten kings had from the Norman conqueror reigned, with intermix and variable fate, when England to her greatest height attained, of power, dominion, glory, wealth, and state. After it had with much ado sustained, the violence of princes with debate for titles and the often mutinies of nobles for their ancient liberties. For first the Norman conquering all by might, by might was forced to keep what he had got, mixing our customs and the form of right, with foreign constitutions he had brought, mastering the mighty, humbling the poorer white, by all severest means that could be wrought, and making the succession doubtful rent, his new-got state, and left it turbulent. Will it be contended on the one side that these lines are mean and senseless? or on the other, that they are not prosaic, and for that reason unpoetic. The poet's well-merited epithet is that of the well-languaged Daniel, but likewise, and by the consent of his contemporaries no less than of all succeeding critics, the prosaic Daniel. Yet those who thus designate this wise and amiable writer, from the frequent incorrespondency of his diction to his metre, in the majority of his compositions, not only deem them valuable and interesting on other accounts, but willingly admit that they are to be found throughout his poems, and especially in his epistles and in his hymen's triumph, many and exquisite specimens of that style which, as the neutral ground of prose and verse, is common to both. A fine and almost faultless extract, eminent as for other beauties, so for its perfection in this species of diction, may be seen in Lamb's dramatic specimens, a work of various interest from the nature of the selections themselves, all from the plays of Shakespeare's contemporaries, and deriving a high additional value from the notes, which are full of just and original criticism, expressed with all the freshness of originality. Among the possible effects of practical adherence to a theory that aims to identify the style of prose and verse, if it does not indeed claim for the latter a yet nearer resemblance to the average style of men in the viva voce intercourse of real life, we might anticipate the following as not the least likely to occur. It will happen, as I have indeed before observed, that the metre itself, the sole acknowledged difference, will occasionally become metre to the eye only. The existence of prosaisms, and that they detract from the merit of a poem, must at length be conceded, when a number of successive lines can be rendered even to the most delicate ear, unrecognisable as verse, or as having even been intended for verse, by simply transcribing them as prose, when if the poem be in blank verse, this can be effected without any alteration, 
or at most by merely restoring one or two words to their proper places from which they have been transplanted for no assignable cause or reason but that of the author's convenience but if it be in rhyme by the mere exchange of the final word of each line for some other of the same meaning equally appropriate dignified and euphonic the answer or objection in the preface to the anticipated remark that metre paves the way to other distinctions is contained in the following words the distinction of rhyme and metre is regular and uniform and not like that produced by what is usually called poetic diction arbitrary and subject to infinite caprices upon which no calculation whatever can be made in the one case the reader is utterly at the mercy of the poet respecting what imagery or diction he may choose to connect with the passion but is this a poet of whom a poet is speaking no surely rather of a fool or madman or at best of a vain or ignorant phantast and might not brains so wild and so deficient make just the same havoc with rhymes and metres as they are supposed to effect with modes and figures of speech how is the reader at the mercy of such men if he continue to read their nonsense is it not his own fault the ultimate end of criticism is much more to establish the principles of writing than to furnish rules how to pass judgment on what has been written by others if indeed it were possible that the two could be separated but if it be asked by what principles the poet is to regulate his own style if he do not adhere closely to the sort and order of words which he hears in the market wake high road or ploughfield i reply by principles the ignorance or neglect of which would convict him of being no poet but a silly or presumptuous usurper of the name by the principles of grammar logic psychology in one word by such a knowledge of the facts material and spiritual that most appertain to his art as if it have been governed and applied by good sense and rendered instinctive by habit becomes the representative and reward of our past conscious reasonings insights and conclusions and acquires the name of taste by what rule that does not leave the reader at the poet's mercy and the poet at his own is the latter to distinguish between the language suitable to suppressed and the language which is characteristic of indulged anger or between that of rage and that of jealousy is it obtained by wandering about in search of angry or jealous people in uncultivated society in order to copy their words or not far rather by the power of imagination proceeding upon the all in each of human nature by meditation rather than by observation and by the latter in consequence only of the former as eyes for which the former has predetermined their field of vision and to which as to its organ it communicates a microscopic power there is not i firmly believe a man now living who has from his own inward experience a clearer intuition than mr wordsworth himself that the last mentioned are the two sources of genial discrimination through the same process and by the same creative agency will the poet distinguish the degree and kind of the excitement produced by the very act of poetic composition as intuitively will he know what differences of style it at once inspires and justifies what intermixture of conscious volition is natural to that state and in what instances such figures and colours of speech degenerate into mere creatures of an arbitrary purpose cold technical artifices of ornament or connection for even as truth is its own light and evidence discovering at once itself and falsehood so is it the prerogative of poetic genius to distinguish by parental instinct its proper offspring from the changelings which the gnomes of vanity or the fairies of fashion may have laid in its cradle or call by its names could a rule be given from without poetry would cease to be poetry and sink into a mechanical art it would be morphosis not poesis the rules of the imagination are themselves the very powers of growth and production the words to which they are reducible present only the outlines and external appearance of the fruit a deceptive counterfeit of the superficial form and colours may be elaborated but the marble peach feels cold and heavy and children only put it to their mouths we find no difficulty in admitting as excellent and the legitimate language of poetic fervour self-impassioned dun's apostrophe to the sun in the second stanza of his progress of the soul thee eye of heaven this great soul envies not by thy male force is all we have begot in the first east thou now beginst to shine sucks early balm and island spices there and wilt anon in thy loose reined career at tagus po sen thames and danau dine and see at night this western world of mine yet hast thou not more nation seen than she who before thee one day began to be and thy frail light being quenched shall long long outlive thee or the next stanza but one great destiny the commissary of god that has marked out a path and period for everything who where we offspring took our ways and ends ceased at one instant thou not of all causes thou whose changeless brow ne'er smiles nor frowns o oh, vouchsafe thou to look and show my story in thy eternal book etc 
as little difficulty do we find in excluding from the honours of unaffected warmth and elevation the madness prepense of pseudo-poesy or the startling hysteric of weakness over-exerting itself which bursts on the unprepared reader in sundry odes and apostrophes to abstract terms such are the odes to jealousy to hope to oblivion and the like in dodsley's collection and the magazines of that day which seldom fail to remind me of an oxford copy of verses on the two suttons commencing with inoculation heavenly maid descend it is not to be denied that men of undoubted talents and even poets of true though not of first-rate genius have from a mistaken theory deluded both themselves and others in the opposite extreme i once read to a company of sensible and well-educated women the introductory period of cowley's preface to his pindaric odes written in imitation of the style and manner of the odes of pindar if says cowley a man should undertake to translate pindar word for word it would be thought that one madman had translated another as may appear when he that understands not the original reads the verbal traduction of him into latin prose than which nothing seems more raving i then proceeded with his own free version of the second olympic composed for the charitable purpose of rationalizing the theban eagle queen of all harmonious things dancing words and speaking strings what god what hero wilt thou sing what happy man to equal glories bring begin begin thy noble choice and let the hills around reflect the image of thy voice pisa does to jove belong jove and pisa claim thy song the fair first fruits of war the olympic games alcides offered up to jove alcides too thy strings may move but oh what man to join with these can worthy prove join theron boldly to their sacred names theron the next honour claims theron to no man gives place if first in pisa's and in virtue's race theron there and he alone even his own swift forefathers has outgone one of the company exclaimed with the full assent of the rest that if the original were madder than this it must be incurably mad i then translated the ode from the greek and as nearly as possible word for word and the impression was that in the general movement of the periods in the form of the connections and transitions and in the sober majesty of lofty sense it appeared to them to approach more nearly than any other poetry they had heard to the style of our bible in the prophetic books the first strophe will suffice as a specimen ye harp controlling hymns or ye hymns the sovereigns of harps what god what hero what man shall we celebrate truly pisa indeed is of jove but the olympiad or the olympic games did hercules establish the first fruits of the spoils of war but theron for the four-horsed car that bore victory to him it behoves us now to voice aloud the just the hospitable the bulwark of agrigentum of renowned fathers the flower even him who preserves his native city erect and safe but are such rhetorical caprices condemnable only for their deviation from the language of real life and are they by no other means to be precluded but by the rejection of all distinctions between prose and verse save that of metre surely good sense and a moderate insight into the constitution of the human mind would be amply sufficient to prove that such language and such combinations are the native product neither of the fancy nor of the imagination that the operation consists in the excitement of surprise by the juxtaposition and apparent reconciliation of widely different or incompatible things as when for instance the hills are made to reflect the image of a voice surely no unusual taste is requisite to see clearly that this compulsory juxtaposition is not produced by the presentation of impressive or delightful forms to the inward vision nor by any sympathy with the modifying powers with which the genius of the poet had united and inspirited all the objects of his thought that it is therefore a species of wit a pure work of the will and implies a leisure and self-possession both of thought and of feeling incompatible with the steady fervour of a mind possessed and filled with the grandeur of its subject to sum up the whole in one sentence when a poem or a part of a poem shall be adduced which is evidently vicious in the figures and sentexture of its style yet for the condemnation of which no reason can be assigned except that it differs from the style in which men actually converse then and not till then can i hold this theory to be either plausible or practicable or capable of furnishing either rule guidance or precaution that might not more easily and more safely as well as more naturally have been deduced in the author's own mind from considerations of grammar logic and the truth and nature of things confirmed by the authority of works whose fame is not of one country nor of one age End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 19. Continuation. Concerning the real object which it is probable Mr. Wordsworth had before him in his critical preface. Elucidation and application of this. It might appear from some passages in the former part of Mr. Wordsworth's preface that he meant to confine his theory of style, and the necessity of a close accordance with the actual language of men, to those particular subjects from low and rustic life, which by way of experiment he had purposed to naturalise as a new species in our English poetry. But from the train of argument that follows, from the reference to Milton, and from the spirit of his critique on Gray's sonnet, those sentences appear to have been rather courtesies of modesty than actual limitations of his system yet so groundless does his system appear on a close examination and so strange and overwhelming in its consequences that i cannot and i do not believe that the poet did ever himself adopt it in the unqualified sense in which his expressions have been understood by others and which indeed according to all the common laws of interpretation they seem to bear what then did he mean i apprehend that in the clear perception not unaccompanied with disgust or contempt of the gaudy affectations of a style which passed current with too many for poetic diction though in truth it had as little pretensions to poetry as to logic or common sense he narrowed his view for the time and feeling a justifiable preference for the language of nature and of good sense even in its humblest and least ornamented forms he suffered himself to express in terms at once too large and too exclusive his predilection for a style the most remote possible from the false and showy splendour which he wished to explode it is possible that this predilection at first merely comparative deviated for a time into direct partiality but the real object which he had in view was i doubt not a species of excellence which had been long before most happily characterised by the judicious and amiable garve whose works are so justly beloved and esteemed by the germans in his remarks on gellert from which the following is literally translated the talent that is required in order to make excellent verses is perhaps greater than the philosopher is ready to admit or would find it in his power to acquire the talent to seek only the apt expression of the thought and yet to find at the same time with it the rhyme and the metre gellert possessed this happy gift if ever any one of our poets possessed it and nothing perhaps contributed more to the great and universal impression which his fables made on their first publication or conduces more to their continued popularity it was a strange and curious phenomenon and such as in germany had been previously unheard of to read verses in which everything was expressed just as one would wish to talk and yet all dignified attractive and interesting and all at the same time perfectly correct as to the measure of the syllables and the rhyme it is certain that poetry when it has attained this excellence makes a far greater impression than prose so much so indeed that even the gratification which the very rhymes afford becomes then no longer a contemptible or trifling gratification however novel this phenomenon may have been in germany at the time of gellert it is by no means new nor yet of recent existence in our language spite of the licentiousness with which spencer occasionally compels the orthography of his words into a subservience to his rhymes the whole fairy queen is an almost continued instance of this beauty wallace's song go lovely rose is doubtless familiar to most of my readers but if i had happened to have had by me the poems of cotton more but far less deservedly celebrated as the author of the virgil travestied i should have indulged myself and i think have gratified many who are not acquainted with his serious works by selecting some admirable specimens of this style there are not a few poems in that volume replete with every excellence of thought image and passion which we expect or desire in the poetry of the milder muse and yet so worded that the reader sees no one reason either in the selection or the order of the words why he might not have said the very same in an appropriate conversation and cannot conceive how indeed he could have expressed such thoughts otherwise without loss or injury to his meaning but in truth our language is and from the first dawn of poetry ever has been particularly rich in compositions distinguished by this excellence the final e which is now mute in chaucer's age was either sounded or dropped indifferently we ourselves still use either beloved or beloved according as the rhyme or measure or the purpose of more or less solemnity may require let the reader then only adopt the pronunciation of the poet and of the court at which he lived both with respect to the final e and to the accentuation of the last syllable i would then venture to ask what even in the colloquial language of elegant and unaffected women who are the peculiar mistresses of pure english and undefiled what could we hear more natural or seemingly more unstudied 
than the following stanzas from Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade. And after this forth to the gate he went, there as Crusade outrode a full good pass, and up and down there made he many a went, and to himself full oft he said, Alas! From hence rode my bliss and my solace, as would blissful God now for his joy, I might have seen again come into Troy. And to the yonder hill I gan her bide, Alas, and there I take of her my leave, and yon I saw her to her father ride, for sorrow of which mine heart shall to cleave. And hither home I came, when it was eve, and here I dwell outcast from all her joy, and steal, till I may seen her eft in Troy. And of himself imagined he oft, to been defated, pale, and waxen less, than he was wont, and that men said in soft, What may it be? Who can the soother guess? Why Troilus hath all this heaviness? And all this nas but his melancholy, that he had of himself such fantasy. Another time imaginin' he would, that every wight that passed him by the way, had of him ruth, and that they say and should, I am right sorry, Troilus will day. And thus he drove a day yet forth or tway, as ye have heard, such life gan he to lead, as he that stood betwixt in hope and dread, for which him like it in his song eschew, the encasin of his woe as he best might, and made a song of words but a few, somewhat his woeful hearter for to light, and when he was from every manner's sight, with softer voice he of his lady dear, that absent was, gan sing as ye may hear. This song, when he thus sung in had full bone, he fill again into his sires old, and every night, as was his wont to don, he stood the bright mooner to behold, and all his sorrow to the moon he told, and said, I wis, when thou art horned new, I shall be glad of all the world be true. Another exquisite master of this species of style, where the scholar and the poet supplies the material, but the perfect well-bred gentleman the expressions and the arrangement, is George Herbert. As from the nature of the subject and the too frequent quaintness of the thoughts, his temple or sacred poems and private ejaculations are comparatively but little known, I shall extract two poems. The first is a sonnet, equally admirable for the weight, number, and expression of the thoughts, and for the simple dignity of the language, unless indeed a fastidious taste should object to the latter half of the sixth line. The second is a poem of greater length, which I have chosen not only for the present purpose, but likewise as a striking example and illustration of an assertion hazarded in a former page of these sketches, namely, that the characteristic fault of our elder poets is the reverse of that which distinguishes too many of our more recent versifiers, the one conveying the most fantastic thoughts in the most correct and natural language, the other in the most fantastic language, conveying the most trivial thoughts. The latter is a riddle of words, the former an enigma of thoughts. The one reminds me of an odd passage in Drayton's ideas. As other men, so I myself do muse, why in this sort I rest invention so, and why these giddy metaphors I use, leaving the path the greater part do go. I will resolve you, I am lunatic. The other recalls a still odder passage in the synagogue, or the shadow of the temple, a connected series of poems in imitation of Herbert's temple, and in some editions annexed to it. Oh, how my mind is gravelled! Not a thought that I can find but's ravelled all to naught. Short ends of threads and narrow shreds of lists, knots, snarled ruffs, loose broken tufts of twists, are my torn meditations ragged clothing, which wound and woven shape a suit for nothing. One while I think, and then I am in pain, to think how to unthink that thought again. Immediately after these burles passages, I cannot proceed to the extracts promised, without changing the ludicrous tone of feeling by the interposition of the three following stanzas of Herbert's. Virtue. Sweet day, so cool, so calm, so bright, the bridal of the earth and sky, the dew shall weep thy fall to-night, for thou must die. Sweet rose, whose hue, angry and brave, bids the rash gazer wipe his eye, thy root is ever in its grave, and thou must die. Sweet spring, full of sweet days and roses, a box where sweets compacted lie, my music shoes, ye have your closes, and all must die. The Bosom Sin, a sonnet by George Herbert. Lord, with what care hast thou begirt us round? Parents first season us, then schoolmasters deliver us to laws, they send us bound to rules of reason, holy messengers, pulpits and Sundays, sorrow dogging sin, affliction sorted, anguish of all sizes, fine nets and stratagems to catch us in, Bibles laid open, millions of surprises, blessings beforehand, ties of gratefulness, the sound of glory ringing in our ears, without our shame, within our consciences, angels and grace, eternal hopes and fears, 
Yet all these fences and their whole array, one cunning bosom sin blows quite away. Love unknown. Dear friend, sit down. The tale is long and sad, and in my faintings I presume your love will more comply than help. A lord I had, and have, of whom some grounds, which may improve, I hold for two lives, and both lives in me. To him I brought a dish of fruit one day, and in the middle place my heart, but he, I sigh to say, looked on a servant who did know his eye better than you know me, or, which is one, than I myself. The servant instantly, quitting the fruit, seized on my heart alone, and threw it in a font wherein did fall a stream of blood, which issued from the side of a great rock, I well remember all, and have good cause. There it was dipped and dyed, and washed and wrung, the very ringing yet and forceth tears. Your heart was foul, I fear. Indeed tis true. I did and do commit many a fault, more than my lease will bear. Yet still asked pardon, and was not denied. But you shall hear. After my heart was well, and clean and fair, as I one eventide, I sigh to tell, walked by myself abroad, I saw a large and spacious furnace flaming, and thereon a boiling cauldron, round about whose verge was in great letters set affliction. The greatness shewed the owner, so I went to fetch a sacrifice out of my fold, thinking with that which I did thus present, to warm his love which I did fear grew cold. But as my heart did tender it, the man who was to take it from me slipped his hand, and threw my heart into the scalding pan. My heart that brought it, do you understand, the offerous heart? Your heart was hard, I fear. Indeed tis true. I found a callous matter, began to spread, and to expatiate there. But with a richer drug than scalding water, I bathed it often, even with holy blood, which at a board, while many drank bare wine, a friend did steal into my cup for good, even taken inwardly, and most divine, to supple hardnesses. But at the length, out of the cauldron getting, Soon I fled unto my house, where to repair the strength which I had lost I hasted to my bed. But when I thought to sleep out all these faults, I sigh to speak. I found that some had stuffed the bed with thoughts, I would say thorns. Dear, could my heart not break, when with my pleasures even my rest was gone? Full well I understood who had been there, for I had given the key to none but one. It must be he. Your heart was dull, I fear. Indeed, a slack and sleepy state of mind did oft possess me, so that when I prayed, though my lips went, my heart did stay behind. But all my scores were by another paid, who took my guilt upon him. Truly, friend, for aught I hear, your master shews to you more favour than you wot of. Mark the end. The font did only what was old renew. The cauldron supplied what was grown too hard. The thorns did quicken what was grown too dull. All did but strive to mend what you had marred. Wherefore be cheered, and praise him to the full, Each day, each hour, each moment of the week, Who fain would have you be new, tender, quick. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of Biographia Literaria This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Chapter 19, Chapter 20. The former subject continued, the neutral style, or that common to prose and poetry, exemplified by specimens from Chaucer, Herbert, and others. I have no fear in declaring my conviction that the excellence defined and exemplified in the preceding chapter is not the characteristic excellence of Mr. Wordsworth's style, because I can add, with equal sincerity, that it is precluded by higher powers. The praise of uniform adherence to genuine logical English is undoubtedly his. Nay, laying the main emphasis on the word uniform, I will dare add that, of all contemporary poets, it is his alone. For, in a less absolute sense of the word, I should certainly include Mr. Bowes, Lord Byron, and, as to all his later writings, Mr. Southey, the exceptions in their works being so few and unimportant. But of the specific excellence described in the quotation from Garver, I appear to find more and more undoubted specimens in the works of others, for instance among the minor poems of Mr. Thomas More, and of our illustrious laureate. To me it will always remain a singular and noticeable fact, that a theory which would establish this lingua communis not only as the best, but as the only commendable style, should have proceeded from a poet whose diction, next to that of Shakespeare and Milton, appears to me of all others the most individualised and characteristic. 
and let it be remembered too that i am now interpreting the controverted passages of mr wordsworth's critical preface by the purpose and object which he may be supposed to have intended rather than by the sense which the words themselves must convey if they are taken without this allowance a person of any taste who had but studied three or four of shakespeare's principal plays would without the name affixed scarcely fail to recognise as shakespeare's a quotation from any other play though but of a few lines a similar peculiarity though in a less degree attends mr wordsworth's style whenever he speaks in his own person or whenever though under a feigned name it is clear that he himself is still speaking as in the different dramatis personae of the recluse even in the other poems in which he purposes to be most dramatic there are few in which it does not occasionally burst forth the reader might often address the poet in his own words with reference to the persons introduced it seems as i retrace the ballad line by line that but half of it is theirs and the better half is thine who having been previously acquainted with any considerable portion of mr wordsworth's publications and having studied them with a full feeling of the author's genius would not at once claim as wordsworthian the little poem on the rainbow the child is father of the man etc or in the lucy gray no mate no comrade lucy knew she dwelt on a wide moor the sweetest thing that ever grew beside a human door or in the idle shepherd boys along the river's stony marge the sand lark chants a joyous song the thrush is busy in the wood and carols loud and strong a thousand lambs are on the rocks all newly born both earth and sky keep jubilee and more than all those boys with their green coronal they never hear the cry that plaintive cry which up the hill comes from the depth of dungeon gill need i mention the exquisite description of the sea-lock in the blind highland boy who but a poet tells a tale in such language to the little ones by the fireside as yet had he many a restless dream both when he heard the eagle scream and when he heard the torrents roar and heard the water beat the shore near where their cottage stood beside a lake their cottage stood not small like ours a peaceful flood but one of mighty size and strange that rough or smooth is full of change and stirring in its bed for to this lake by night and day the great sea water finds its way through long long windings of the hills and drinks up all the pretty rills and rivers large and strong then hurries back the road it came returns on errands still the same this did it when the earth was new and this for evermore will do as long as earth shall last and with the coming of the tide come boats and ships that sweetly ride between the woods and lofty rocks and to the shepherds with their flocks bring tales of distant lands i might quote almost the whole of his ruth but take the following stanzas but as you have before been told this stripling sportive gay and bold and with his dancing crest so beautiful through savage lands had roamed about with vagrant bands of indians in the west the wind the tempest roaring high the tumult of a tropic sky might well be dangerous food for him a youth to whom was given so much of earth so much of heaven and such impetuous blood whatever in those climes he found irregular in sight or sound did to his mind impart a kindred impulse seemed allied to his own powers and justified the workings of his heart nor less to feed voluptuous thought the beauteous forms of nature wrought fair trees and lovely flowers the breezes their own languor lent the stars had feelings which they sent into those magic bowers yet in his worst pursuits i ween that sometimes there did intervene pure hopes of high intent for passions linked to form so fair and stately needs must have their share of noble sentiment but from mr wordsworth's more elevated compositions which already form three-fourths of his works and will i trust constitute hereafter a still larger proportion from these whether in rhyme or blank verse it would be difficult and almost superfluous to select instances of a diction peculiarly his own of a style which cannot be imitated without its being at once recognised as originating in mr wordsworth it would not be easy to open on any one of his loftier strains that does not contain examples of this and more in proportion as the lines are more excellent and most like the author for those who may happen to have been less familiar with his writings i will give three specimens taken with little choice the first from the lines on the boy of winander mere who blew mimic hootings to the silent owls that they might answer him and they would shout across the watery vale and shout again with long halloos and screams and echoes loud redoubled and redoubled concourse wild of mirth and jocund din and when it chanced that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill and sometimes in that silence while he hung listening a gentle shock of mild surprise 
has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents or the visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery its rocks its woods and that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake the second shall be that noble imitation of drayton if it was not rather a coincidence in the lines to joanna when i had gazed perhaps two minutes space joanna looking in my eyes beheld that ravishment of mine and laughed aloud the rock like something starting from a sleep took up the lady's voice and laughed again that ancient woman seated on helm crag was ready with her cavern hammer scar and the tall steep of silver house sent forth a noise of laughter southern longbrig heard and fairfield answered with a mountain tone helvellyn far into the clear blue sky carried the lady's voice old skiddor blew his speaking trumpet back out of the clouds from glaramara southward came the voice and kirkstone tossed it from its misty head the third which is in rhyme i take from the song at the feast of broom castle upon the restoration of lord clifford the shepherd to the estates and honours of his ancestors now another day is come fitter hope and nobler doom he hath thrown aside his crook and hath buried deep his book armour rusting in his halls on the blood of clifford calls quell the scot exclaims the lance bear me to the heart of france is the longing of the shield tell thy name thou trembling field field of death where'er thou be groan thou with our victory happy day and mighty hour when our shepherd in his power mailed and horsed with lance and sword to his ancestors restored like a reappearing star like a glory from afar first shall head the flock of war alas the fervent harper did not know that for a tranquil soul the lay was framed who long compelled in humble walks to go was softened into feeling soothed and tamed love had he found in huts where poor men lie his daily teachers had been woods and rills the silence that is in the starry sky the sleep that is among the lonely hills the words themselves in the foregoing extracts are no doubt sufficiently common for the greater part but in what poem are they not so if we accept a few misadventurous attempts to translate the arts and sciences into verse in the excursion the number of polysyllabic or what the common people call dictionary words is more than usually great and so must it needs be in proportion to the number and variety of an author's conceptions and his solicitude to express them with precision but are those words in those places commonly employed in real life to express the same thought or outward thing are they the style used in the ordinary intercourse of spoken words no nor are the modes of connections and still less the breaks and transitions would any but a poet at least could any one without being conscious that he had expressed himself with noticeable vivacity have described a bird singing loud by the thrush is busy in the wood or have spoken of boys with a string of club moss round their rusty hats as the boys with their green coronal or have translated a beautiful may day into both earth and sky keep jubilee or have brought all the different marks and circumstances of a sea-lock before the mind as the actions of a living and acting power or have represented the reflection of the sky in the water as that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake even the grammatical construction is not unfrequently peculiar as the wind the tempest roaring high the tumult of a tropic sky might well be dangerous food to him a youth to whom was given etc there is a peculiarity in the frequent use of the asymataton that is the omission of the connective particle before the last of several words or several sentences used grammatically as single words all being in the same case and governing or governed by the same verb and not less in the construction of words by apposition to him a youth in short were they excluded from mr wordsworth's poetic compositions all that a little adherence to the theory of his preface would exclude two-thirds at least of the marked beauties of his poetry must be erased for a far greater number of lines would be sacrificed than in any other reason poet because the pleasure received from wordsworth's poems being less derived either from excitement of curiosity or the rapid flow of narration the striking passages form a larger proportion of their value i do not adduce it as a fair criterion of comparative excellence nor do i even think it such but merely as matter of fact i affirm that from no contemporary writer could so many lines be quoted without reference to the poem in which they are found for their own independent weight or beauty from the sphere of my own experience i can bring to my recollection three persons of no everyday powers and acquirements who had read the poems of others with more and more unallied pleasure 
and had thought more highly of their authors as poets, who yet have confessed to me that from no modern work had so many passages started up anew in their minds at different times, and as different occasions had awakened a meditative mood. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter Twenty One. Remarks on the present mode of conducting critical journals. Long have I wished to see a fair and philosophical inquisition into the character of Wordsworth as a poet on the evidence of his published works and a positive not a comparative appreciation of their characteristic excellencies deficiencies and defects i know no claim that the mere opinion of any individual can have to weigh down the opinion of the author himself against the probability of whose parental partiality we ought to set that of his having thought longer and more deeply on the subject but i should call that investigation fair and philosophical in which the critic announces and endeavours to establish the principles which he holds for the foundation of poetry in general with the specification of these in their application to the different classes of poetry having thus prepared his canons of criticism for praise and condemnation he would proceed to particularize the most striking passages to which he deems them applicable faithfully noticing the frequent or infrequent recurrence of similar merits or defects and as faithfully distinguishing what is characteristic from what is accidental or a mere flagging of the wing then if his premises be rational his deductions legitimate and his conclusions justly applied the reader and possibly the poet himself may adopt his judgment in the light of judgment and in the independence of free agency if he has erred he presents his errors in a definite place and tangible form and holds the torch and guides the way to their detection i most willingly admit and estimate at a high value the services which the edinburgh review and others formed afterwards on the same plan have rendered to society in the diffusion of knowledge i think the commencement of the edinburgh review an important epoch in periodical criticism and that it has a claim upon the gratitude of the literary republic and indeed of the reading public at large for having originated the scheme of reviewing those books only which are susceptible and deserving of argumentative criticism not less meritorious and far more faithfully and in general far more ably executed is their plan of supplying the vacant place of the trash or mediocrity wisely left to sink into oblivion by its own weight with original essays on the most interesting subjects of the time, religious or political, in which the titles of the books or pamphlets prefixed furnish only the name and occasion of the disquisition. I do not arraign the keenness or asperity of its damnatory style, in and for itself, as long as the author is addressed or treated as the mere impersonation of the work then under trial. I have no quarrel with them on this account, as long as no personal allusions are admitted, and no recommitment for new trial of juvenile performances that were published perhaps forgotten many years before the commencement of the review since for the forcing back of such works to public notice no motives are easily assignable but such as are furnished to the critic by his own personal malignity or what is still worse by a habit of malignity in the form of mere wantonness no private grudge they need no personal spite the viva sectio is its own delight all enmity all envy they disclaim disinterested thieves of our good name cool sober murderers of their neighbour's fame s t c every censure every sarcasm respecting a publication which the critic with the criticised work before him can make good is the critic's right the writer is authorised to reply but not to complain neither can any one prescribe to the critic how soft or how hard how friendly or how bitter shall be the phrases which he is to select for the expression of such reprehension or ridicule the critic must know what effect it is his object to produce, and with a view to this effect must he weigh his words. But as soon as the critic betrays that he knows more of his author than the author's publications could have told him, as soon as from this more intimate knowledge elsewhere obtained he avails himself of the slightest trait against the author, his censure instantly becomes personal injury, his sarcasms personal insults. He ceases to be a critic and takes on him the most contemptible character to which a rational creature can be degraded that of a gossip, backbiter, and pasquillant, but with this heavy aggravation that he steals the unquiet, the deforming passions of the world into the museum, into the very place which, next to the chapel and oratory, should be our sanctuary and secure place of refuge, offers abominations on the altar of the muses, and makes its sacred paling the very circle in which he conjures up the lying and profane spirit. End of chapter 21
this determination of unlicensed personality and of permitted and legitimate censure which i owe in part to the illustrious lessing himself a model of acute spirited sometimes stinging but always argumentative and honourable criticism is beyond controversy the true one and though i would not myself exercise all the rights of the latter yet let but the former be excluded i submit myself to its exercise in the hands of others without complaint and without resentment let a communication be formed between any number of learned men in the various branches of science and literature and whether the president and central committee be in london or edinburgh if only they previously lay aside their individuality and pledge themselves inwardly as well as ostensibly to administer judgment according to a constitution and code of laws and if by grounding this code on the twofold basis of universal morals and philosophic reason independent of all foreseen application to particular works and authors they obtain the right to speak each as the representative of their body corporate they shall have honour and good wishes for me and i shall accord to them their fair dignities though self-assumed not less cheerfully than if i could inquire concerning them in the herald's office or turn to them in the book of peerage however loud may be the outcries for a prevented or subverted reputation however numerous and impatient the complaints of merciless severity and insupportable despotism i shall neither feel nor utter aught but to the defence and justification of the critical machine should any literary quixote find himself provoked by its sounds and regular movements i should admonish him with sancho panza that it is no giant but a windmill there it stands on its own place and its own hillock never goes out of its way to attack any one and to none and from none either gives or asks assistance when the public press has poured in any part of its produce between its millstones it grinds it off one man's sack the same as another and with whatever wind may happen to be then blowing all the two-and-thirty winds are alike its friends of the whole wide atmosphere it does not desire a single finger-breath more than what is necessary for its sails to turn round in but this space must be left free and unimpeded gnats beetles wasps butterflies and the whole tribe of ephemerals and insignificance may flit in and out and between may hum and buzz and jar may shrill their tiny pipes and whine their puny horns unchastised and unnoticed but idlers and bravados of larger size and prouder show must beware how they place themselves within its sweep much less may they presume to lay hands on the sails the strength of which is neither greater nor less than as the wind is which drives them round whomsoever the remorseless arm slings aloft or whirls along with it in the air he has himself alone to blame though when the same arm throws him from it it will more often double than break the force of his fall putting aside the too manifest and too frequent interference of national party and even personal predilection or aversion and reserving for deeper feelings those worse and more criminal intrusions into the sacredness of private life which not seldom merit legal rather than literary chastisement the two principal objects and occasions which i find for blame and regret in the conduct of the review in question are first its unfaithfulness to its own announced and excellent plan by subjecting to criticism works neither indecent nor immoral yet of such trifling importance even in point of size and according to the critic's own verdict so devoid of all merit as must excite in the most candid mind the suspicion either that dislike or vindictive feelings were at work or that there was a cold prudential predetermination to increase the sale of the review by flattering the malignant passions of human nature that i may not myself become subject to the charge which i am bringing against others by an accusation without proof i refer to the article on dr reynolds sermon in the very first number of the edinburgh review as an illustration of my meaning if in looking through all the succeeding volumes the reader should find this a solitary instance i must submit to that painful forfeiture of esteem which awaits a groundless or exaggerated charge the second point of objection belongs to this review only in common with all other works of periodical criticism at least it applies in common to the general system of all whatever exception there may be in favour of particular articles or if it attaches to the edinburgh review and to its only co-rival the quarterly with any peculiar force this results from the superiority of talent acquirement and information which both have so undeniably displayed and which doubtless deepens the regret though not the blame i am referring to the substitution of assertion for argument to the frequency of arbitrary and sometimes petulant verdicts not seldom unsupported even by a single quotation from the work condemned which might at least have explained the critic's meaning if it did not prove the justice of his sentence even where this is not the case the extracts are too often made without reference to any general grounds or rules from which the faultiness or inadmissibility of the qualities attributed may be deduced and without any attempt to show that the qualities are attributable to the passage extracted 
I have met with such extracts from Mr. Wordsworth's poems annexed to such assertions, as led me to imagine that the reviewer, having written his critique before he had read the work, had then pricked with a pin for passages, wherewith to illustrate the various branches of his preconceived opinions. By what principle of rational choice can we suppose a critic to have been directed, at least in a Christian country, and himself, we hope, a Christian, who gives the following lines, portraying the fervour of solitary devotion, excited by the magnificent display of the Almighty's works, as a proof and example of an author's tendency to downright ravings and absolute unintelligibility o oh, then what soul was his when on the tops of the high mountains he beheld the sun rise up and bathe the world in light he looked ocean and earth the solid frame of earth and ocean's liquid mass beneath him lay in gladness and deep joy the clouds were touched and in their silent faces did he read unutterable love sound needed none nor any voice of joy his spirit drank the spectacle sensation soul and form all melted into him they swallowed up his animal being in them did he live and by them did he live they were his life can it be expected that either the author or his admirers should be induced to pay any serious attention to decisions which prove nothing but the pitiable state of the critic's own taste and sensibility on opening the review they see a favourite passage of the force and truth of which they had an intuitive certainty in their own inward experience confirmed if confirmation it could receive by the sympathy of their most enlightened friends some of whom perhaps even in the world's opinion hold a higher intellectual rank than the critic himself would presume to claim and this very passage they find selected as the characteristic effusion of a mind deserted by reason as furnishing evidence that the writer was raving or he could not have thus strung words together without sense or purpose no diversity of taste seems capable of explaining such a contrast in judgment that i had overrated the merit of a passage or poem that i had erred concerning the degree of its excellence i might be easily induced to believe or apprehend but that lines the sense of which i had analysed and found consonant with all the best convictions of my understanding and the imagery and diction of which had collected round those convictions my noblest as well as my most delightful feelings that i should admit such lines to be mere nonsense or lunacy is too much for the most ingenious arguments to effect but that such a revolution of taste should be brought about by a few broad assertions seems little less than impossible on the contrary it would require an effort of charity not to dismiss the criticism with the aphorism of the wise man in animam malevolam sapientia haud intrare potest what then if this very critic should have cited a large number of single lines and even of long paragraphs which he himself acknowledges to possess eminent and original beauty what if he himself has owned that beauties as great are scattered in abundance throughout the whole book and yet though under this impression should have commenced his critique in vulgar exultation with a prophecy meant to secure its own fulfilment with a this won't do what if after such acknowledgments extorted from his own judgment he should proceed from charge to charge of tameness and raving flights and flatness and at length consigning the author to the house of incurables should conclude with a strain of rudest contempt evidently grounded in the distempered state of his own moral associations suppose too all this done without a single leading principle established or even announced and without any one attempt at argumentative deduction though the poet had presented a more than usual opportunity for it by having previously made public his own principles of judgment in poetry and supported them by a connected train of reasoning the office and duty of the poet is to select the most dignified as well as the gayest happiest attitude of things the reverse for in all cases a reverse is possible is the appropriate business of burlesque and travesty a predominant taste for which has been always deemed a mark of a low and degraded mind when i was at rome among many other visits to the tomb of julius the second i went thither once with a prussian artist a man of genius and great vivacity of feeling as we were gazing on michelangelo's moses our conversation turned on the horns and beard of that stupendous statue of the necessity of each to support the other of the superhuman effect of the former and the necessity of the existence of both to give a harmony and integrity both to the image and the feeling excited by it conceive them removed and the statue would become unnatural without being supernatural we call to mind the horns of the rising sun and i repeated the noble passage from taylor's holy dying that horns were the emblem of power and sovereignty among the eastern nations and are still retained as such in abyssinia the achilleus of the ancient greeks and the probable ideas and feelings that originally suggested the mixture of the human and the brute form in the figure by which they realised the idea of their mysterious pan as representing intelligence blended with a darker power deeper mightier and more universal than the conscious intellect of man than intelligence all these thoughts and recollections passed in procession before our minds 
my companion who possessed more than his share of the hatred which his countrymen bore to the french had just observed to me a frenchman sir is the only animal in the human shape that by no possibility can lift itself up to religion or poetry when lo two french officers of distinction and rank enter the church mark you whispered the prussian the first thing which those scoundrels will notice for they will begin by instantly noticing the statue in parts without one moment's pause of admiration impressed by the whole will be the horns and the beard and the associations which they will immediately connect with them will be those of a he-goat and a cuckold never did man guess more luckily had he inherited a portion of the great legislator's prophetic powers whose statue we had been contemplating he could scarcely have uttered words more coincident with the result for even as he had said so it came to pass in the excursion the poet has introduced an old man born in humble but not abject circumstances who had enjoyed more than usual advantages of education both from books and from the more awful discipline of nature this person he represents as having been driven by the restlessness of fervid feelings and from a craving intellect to an itinerant life and as having in consequence passed the larger portion of his time from earliest manhood in villages and hamlets from door to door a vagrant merchant bent beneath his load now whether this be a character appropriate to a lofty didactic poem is perhaps questionable it presents a fair subject for controversy and the question is to be determined by the congruity or incongruity of such a character with what shall be proved to be the essential constituents of poetry but surely the critic who passing by all the opportunities which such a mode of life would present to such a man all the advantages of the liberty of nature of solitude and of solitary thought all the varieties of places and seasons through which his track had lain with all the varying imagery they bring with them and lastly all the observations of men their manners their enjoyments and pursuits their passions and their feelings which the memory of these yearly journeys must have given and recalled to such a mind the critic i say who from the multitude of possible associations should pass by all these in order to fix his attention exclusively on the pin-papers and stay-tapes which might have been among the wares of his pack this critic in my opinion cannot be thought to possess a much higher or much healthier state of moral feeling than the frenchman above recorded End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter twenty two the characteristic defects of wordsworth's poetry with the principles from which the judgment that they are defects is deduced their proportion to the beauties for the greatest part characteristic of his theory only if mr wordsworth have set forth principles of poetry which his arguments are insufficient to support let him and those who have adopted his sentiments be set right by the confutation of those arguments and by the substitution of more philosophical principles and still let the due credit be given to the portion and importance of the truths which are blended with his theory truths the too exclusive attention to which had occasioned its errors by tempting him to carry those truths beyond their proper limits if his mistaken theory have at all influenced his poetic compositions let the effects be pointed out and the instances given but let it likewise be shown how far the influence has acted whether diffusively or only by starts whether the number and importance of the poems and passages thus infected be great or trifling compared with the sound portion and lastly whether they are inwoven into the texture of his works or are loose and separable the result of such a trial would evince beyond a doubt what it is high time to announce decisively and aloud that the supposed characteristics of mr wordsworth's poetry whether admired or reprobated whether they are simplicity or simpleness faithful adherence to essential nature or wilful selections from human nature of its meanest forms and under the least attractive associations are as little the real characteristics of his poetry at large as of his genius and the constitution of his mind in a comparatively small number of poems he chose to try an experiment and this experiment we will suppose to have failed yet even in these poems it is impossible not to perceive that the natural tendency of the poet's mind is to great objects and elevated conceptions the poem entitled fidelity is for the greater part written in language as unraised and naked as any perhaps in the two volumes yet take the following stanza and compare it with the preceding stanzas of the same poem there sometimes doth a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer the crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony austere thither the rainbow comes the cloud and mist that spread the flying shroud 
and sunbeams and the sounding blast that if it could would hurry past but that enormous barrier holds it fast or compare the four last lines of the concluding stanza with the former half yes proof was plain that since the day on which the traveller thus had died the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side how nourished here through such long time he knows who gave that love sublime and gave that strength of feeling great above all human estimate can any candid and intelligent mind hesitate in determining which of these best represents the tendency and native character of the poet's genius will he not decide that the one was written because the poet would so write and the other because he could not so entirely repress the force and grandeur of his mind but that he must in some part or other of every composition write otherwise in short that his only disease is the being out of his element like the swan that having amused himself for a while with crushing the weeds on the river's bank soon returns to his own majestic movements on its reflecting and sustaining surface let it be observed that i am here supposing the imagined judge to whom i appeal to have already decided against the poet's theory as far as it is different from the principles of the art generally acknowledged i cannot here enter into a detailed examination of mr wordsworth's works but i will attempt to give the main results of my own judgment after an acquaintance of many years and repeated perusals and though to appreciate the defects of a great mind it is necessary to understand previously its characteristic excellences yet i have already expressed myself with sufficient fulness to preclude most of the ill effects that might arise from my pursuing a contrary arrangement i will therefore commence with what i deem the prominent defects of his poems hitherto published the first characteristic though only occasional defect which i appear to myself to find in these poems is the inconstancy of the style under this name i refer to the sudden and unprepared transitions from lines or sentences of peculiar felicity at all events striking and original to a style not only unimpassioned but undistinguished he sinks too often and too abruptly to that style which i should place in the second division of language dividing it into the three species first that which is peculiar to poetry second that which is only proper in prose and third the neutral or common to both there have been works such as cowley's essay on cromwell in which prose and verse are intermixed not as in the consolation of boetius or the argenis of Berkeley, by the insertion of poems supposed to have been spoken or composed on occasions previously related in prose but the poet passing from one to the other as the nature of the thoughts or his own feelings dictated yet this mode of composition does not satisfy a cultivated taste there is something unpleasant in the being thus obliged to alternate states of feeling so dissimilar and this too in a species of writing the pleasure from which is in part derived from the preparation and previous expectation of the reader a portion of that awkwardness is felt which hangs upon the introduction of songs in our modern comic operas and to prevent which the judicious metastasio as to whose exquisite taste there can be no hesitation whatever doubts may be entertained as to his poetic genius uniformly placed the aria at the end of the scene at the same time that he almost always raises and impassions the style of the recitative immediately preceding even in real life the difference is great and evident between words used as the arbitrary marks of thought our smooth market coin of intercourse with the image and superscription worn out by currency and those which convey pictures either borrowed from one outward object to enliven and particularize some other or used allegorically to body forth the inward state of the person speaking or such as are at least the exponents of his peculiar turn and unusual extent of faculty so much so indeed that in the social circles of private life we often find a striking use of the latter put a stop to the general flow of conversation and by the excitement arising from consented attention produce a sort of damp and interruption for some minutes after but in the perusal of works of literary art we prepare ourselves for such language and the business of the writer like that of a painter whose subject requires unusual splendour and prominence is so to raise the lower and neutral tints that what in a different style would be the commanding colours are here used as the means of that gentle degradation requisite in order to produce the effect of a whole where this is not achieved in a poem the metre merely reminds the reader of his claims in order to disappoint them and where this defect occurs frequently his feelings are alternately startled by anticlimax and hyperclimax i refer the reader to the exquisite stanza cited for another purpose from the blind highland boy and then annex as being in my opinion instances of this disharmony in style the two following and one the rarest was a shell which he poor child had studied well 
the shell of a green turtle thin and hollow you might sit therein it was so wide and deep our highland boy oft visited the house which held this prize and led by choice or chance did thither come one day when no one was at home and found the door unbarred or page a hundred and seventy two volume one tis gone forgotten let me do my best there was a smile or two i can remember them i see the smiles worth all the world to me dear baby i must lay thee down thou troublest me with strange alarms smiles hast thou sweet ones of thine own i cannot keep thee in my arms for they confound me as it is i have forgot those smiles of his or page two hundred and sixty nine volume one thou hast a nest for thy love and thy rest and though little troubled with sloth drunken lark thou wouldst be loath to be such a traveller as i happy happy liver with a soul as strong as a mountain river pouring out praise to the almighty giver joy and jollity be with us both hearing thee or else some other as merry a brother i on the earth will go plodding on by myself cheerfully till the day is done the incongruity which i appear to find in this passage is that of the two noble lines in italics with the preceding and following so volume two page thirty close by a pond upon the further side he stood alone a minute's space i guess i watched him he continuing motionless to the pool's further margin than i drew he being all the while before me full in view compare this with the repetition of the same image the next stanza but two and still as i drew near with gentle pace beside the little pond or moorish flood motionless as a clod the old man stood that heareth not the loud winds when they call and moveth altogether if it move at all or lastly the second of the three following stanzas compared both with the first and the third my former thoughts returned the fear that kills and hope that is unwilling to be fed cold pain and labour and all fleshly ills and mighty poets in their misery dead but now perplexed by what the old man had said my question eagerly did i renew how is it that you live and what is it you do he with a smile did then his words repeat and said that gathering leeches far and wide he travels stirring thus about his feet the waters of the ponds where they abide once i could meet with them on every side but they have dwindled long by slow decay yet still i persevere and find them where i may while he was talking thus the lonely place the old man's shape and speech all troubled me in my mind's eye i seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually wandering about alone and silently indeed this fine poem is especially characteristic of the author there is scarce a defect or excellence in his writings of which it would not present a specimen but it would be unjust not to repeat that this defect is only occasional from a careful reperusal of the two volumes of poems i doubt whether the objectionable passages would amount in the whole to one hundred lines not the eighth part of the number of pages in the excursion the feeling of incongruity is seldom excited by the diction of any passage considered in itself but by the sudden superiority of some other passage forming the content the second defect i can generalize with tolerable accuracy if the reader will pardon an uncouth and new coined word there is i should say not seldom a matter of factness in certain poems this may be divided into first a laborious minuteness and fidelity in the representation of objects and their positions as they appeared to the poet himself secondly the insertion of accidental circumstances in order to the full explanation of his living characters their dispositions and actions which circumstances might be necessary to establish the probability of a statement in real life where nothing is taken for granted by the hearer but appears superfluous in poetry where the reader is willing to believe for his own sake to this accidentality i object as contravening the essence of poetry which aristotle pronounces to be sudiotaton kai philosophotaton genos the most intense weighty and philosophical product of human art adding as the reason that it is the most catholic and abstract the following passage from davenant's prefatory letter to hobbes well expresses this truth when i considered the actions which i meant to describe those inferring the persons i was again persuaded rather to choose those of a former age than the present and in a century so far removed as might preserve me from their improper examinations who know not the requisites of a poem nor how much pleasure they lose and even the pleasure of heroic poesy are not unprofitable who take away the liberty of a poet and fetter his feet in the shackles of an historian for why should a poet doubt in story to mend the intrigues of fortune by more delightful conveyances of probable fictions because austere historians have entered into bond to truth an obligation which were in poets as foolish and unnecessary as is the bondage of false martyrs who lie in chains for a mistaken opinion but by this i would imply that truth narrative and past is the idol of historians who worship a dead thing and truth operative and by effects continually alive is the mistress of poets 
who hath not her existence in matter but in reason for this minute accuracy in the painting of local imagery the lines in the excursion pages ninety six ninety seven and ninety eight may be taken if not as a striking instance yet as an illustration of my meaning it must be some strong motive as for instance that the description was necessary to the intelligibility of the tale which could induce me to describe in a number of verses what a draughtsman could present to the eye with incomparably greater satisfaction by half a dozen strokes of his pencil or the painter with as many touches of his brush such descriptions too often occasion in the mind of a reader who is determined to understand his author a feeling of labour not very dissimilar to that with which he would construct a diagram line by line for a long geometrical proposition it seems to be like taking the pieces of a dissected map out of its box we first look at one part and then at another then join and dovetail them and when the successive acts of attention have been completed there is a retrogressive effort of mind to behold it as a whole the poet should paint to the imagination not to the fancy and i know no happier case to exemplify the distinction between these two faculties masterpieces of the former mode of poetic painting abound in the writings of milton for example the fig tree not that kind for fruit renowned but such as at this day to indians known in malabar or deccan spreads her arms branching so broad and long that in the ground the bended twigs take root and daughters grow about the mother tree a pillared shade high over arched and echoing walks between there off the indian herdsman shunning heat shelters in cool and tends his pasturing herds at hoop-holes cut through thickest shade this is creation rather than painting or if painting yet such and with such co-presence of the whole picture flashed at once upon the eye as the sun paints in a camera obscura but the poet must likewise understand and command what bacon calls the vestigia communia of the senses the latency of all in each and more especially as by a magical penny duplex the excitement of vision by sound and the exponents of sound thus the echoing walks between may be almost said to reverse the fable in tradition of the head of memnon in the egyptian statue such may be deservedly entitled the creative words in the world of imagination the second division respects an apparent minute adherence to matter of fact in character and incidents a biographical attention to probability and an anxiety of explanation and retrospect under this head i shall deliver with no feigned diffidence the results of my best reflection on the great point of controversy between mr wordsworth and his objectors namely on the choice of his characters i have already declared and i trust justified my utter dissent from the mode of argument which his critics have hitherto employed to their question why did you choose such a character or a character from such a rank of life the poet might in my opinion fairly retort why with the conception of my character did you make wilful choice of mean or ludicrous associations not furnished by me but supplied from your own sickly and fastidious feelings how was it indeed probable that such arguments could have any weight with an author whose plan whose guiding principle and main object it was to attack and subdue that state of association which leads us to place the chief value on those things on which man differs from man and to forget or disregard the high dignities which belong to human nature the sense and the feeling which may be and ought to be found in all ranks the feelings with which as christians we contemplate a mixed congregation rising or kneeling before their common maker mr wordsworth would have us entertain at all times as men and as readers and by the excitement of this lofty yet prideless impartiality in poetry he might hope to have encouraged its continuance in real life the praise of good men be his in real life and i trust even in my imagination i honour a virtuous and wise man without reference to the presence or absence of artificial advantages whether in the person of an armed baron a laurelled bard or of an old peddler or still older leech-gatherer the same qualities of head and heart must claim the same reverence and even in poetry i am not conscious that i have ever suffered my feelings to be disturbed or offended by any thoughts or images which the poet himself has not presented but yet i object nevertheless and for the following reasons first because the object in view as an immediate object belongs to the moral philosopher and would be pursued not only more appropriately but in my opinion with far greater probability of success in sermons or moral essays than in an elevated poem it seems indeed to destroy the main fundamental distinction not only between a poem and prose but even between philosophy and works of fiction inasmuch as it proposes truth for its immediate object instead of pleasure now till the blessed time shall come when truth itself shall be pleasure and both shall be so united as to be distinguishable in words only not in feeling it will remain the poet's office to proceed upon that state of association which actually exists as general instead of attempting first to make it what it ought to be and then to let the pleasure follow but here is unfortunately a small hysteron proteron 
for the communication of pleasure is the introductory means by which alone the poet must expect to moralise his readers secondly though i were to admit for a moment this argument to be groundless yet how is the moral effect to be produced by merely attaching the name of some low profession to powers which are least likely and to qualities which are assuredly not more likely to be found in it the poet speaking in his own person may at once delight and improve us by sentiments which teach us the independence of goodness of wisdom and even of genius on the favours of fortune and having made a due reverence before the throne of antonine he may bow with equal awe before epictetus among his fellow-slaves and rejoice in the plain presence of his dignity who is not at once delighted and improved when the poet wordsworth himself exclaims o oh, many are the poets that are sown by nature men endowed with highest gifts the vision and the faculty divine yet wanting the accomplishment of verse nor having e'er as life advanced been led by circumstance to take unto the height the measure of themselves these favoured beings all but a scattered few live out their time husbanding that which they possess within and go to the grave unthought of strongest minds are often those of whom the noisy world hears least to use a colloquial phrase such sentiments in such language do one's heart good though i for my part have not the fullest faith in the truth of the observation on the contrary i believe the instances to be exceedingly rare and should feel almost as strong an objection to introduce such a character in a poetic fiction as a pair of black swans on a lake in a fancy landscape when i think how many and how much better books than homer or even than herodotus pindar or aeschylus could have read are in the power of almost every man in a country where almost every man is instructed to read and write and how restless how difficultly hidden the powers of genius are and yet find even in situations the most favourable according to mr wordsworth for the formation of a pure and poetic language in situations which ensure familiarity with the grandest objects of the imagination but one burns among the shepherds of scotland and not a single poet of humble life among those of english lakes and mountains i conclude that poetic genius is not only a very delicate but a very rare plant but be this as it may the feelings with which i think of chatterton the marvellous boy the sleepless soul that perished in his pride of burns who walked in glory and in joy behind his plough upon the mountain side are widely different from those with which i should read a poem where the author having occasion for the character of a poet and a philosopher in the fable of his narration had chosen to make him a chimney-sweeper and then in order to remove all doubts on the subject had invented an account of his birth parentage and education with all the strange and fortunate accidents which had concurred in making him at once poet philosopher and sweep nothing but biography can justify this if it be admissible even in a novel it must be one in the manner of defoe's that were meant to pass for histories not in the manner of fielding's in the life of moll flanders or colonel jack not in a tom jones or even a joseph andrews much less then can it be legitimately introduced in a poem the characters of which amid the strongest individualization must still remain representative the precepts of horace on this point are grounded on the nature both of poetry and of the human mind they are not more peremptory than wise and prudent for in the first place a deviation from them perplexes the reader's feelings and all the circumstances which are feigned in order to make such accidents less improbable divide and disquiet his faith rather than aid and support it spite of all attempts the fiction will appear and unfortunately not as fictitious but as false the reader not only knows that the sentiments and language are the poet's own and his own too in his artificial character as poet but by the fruitless endeavours to make him think the contrary he is not even suffered to forget it the effect is similar to that produced by an epic poet when the fable and the characters are derived from scripture history as in the messiah of klopstock or in cumberland's calvary and not merely suggested by it as in the paradise lost of milton that illusion contradistinguished from delusion that negative faith which simply permits the images presented to work by their own force without either denial or affirmation of their real existence by the judgment is rendered impossible by their immediate neighbourhood to words and facts of known and absolute truth a faith which transcends even historic belief must absolutely put out this mere poetic analogon of faith as the summer sun is said to extinguish our household fires when it shines full upon them what would otherwise have been yielded to as pleasing fiction is repelled as revolting falsehood the effect produced in this latter case by the solemn belief of the reader is in a less degree brought about in the instances to which i have been objecting by the balked attempts of the author to make him believe add to all the foregoing the seeming uselessness both of the project and of the anecdotes from which it is to derive support is there one word for instance attributed to the peddler in the excursion characteristic of a peddler one sentiment that might not more plausibly even without the aid of any previous explanation 
have proceeded from any wise and beneficent old man of a rank or profession in which the language of learning and refinement are natural and to be expected need the rank have been at all particularized where nothing follows which the knowledge of that rank is to explain or illustrate when on the contrary this information renders the man's language feelings sentiments and information a riddle which must itself be solved by episodes of anecdote finally when this and this alone could have induced a genuine poet to imweave in a poem of the loftiest style and on subjects the loftiest and of the most universal interest such minute matters of fact not unlike those furnished for the obituary of a magazine by the friends of some obscure ornament of society lately deceased in some obscure town as among the hills of athol he was born there on a small hereditary farm an unproductive slip of rugged ground his father dwelt and died in poverty while he whose lowly fortune i retrace the youngest of three sons was yet a babe a little one unconscious of their loss but ere he had outgrown his infant days his widowed mother for a second mate espoused the teacher of the village school who on her offspring zealously bestowed needful instruction from his sixth year the boy of whom i speak in summer tended cattle on the hills but through the inclement and the perilous days of long continuing winter he repaired to his stepfather's school etc for all the admirable passages interposed in this narration might with trifling alterations have been far more appropriately and with far greater verisimilitude told of a poet in the character of a poet and without incurring another defect which i shall now mention and a sufficient illustration of which will have been here anticipated third an undue predilection for the dramatic form in certain poems from which one or other of two evils result either the thoughts and diction are different from that of the poet and then there arises an incongruity of style or they are the same and indistinguishable and then it presents a species of ventriloquism where two are represented as talking while in truth one man only speaks the fourth class of defects is closely connected with the former but yet are such as arise likewise from an intensity of feeling disproportionate to such knowledge and value of the objects described as can be fairly anticipated of men in general even of the most cultivated classes and with which therefore few only and those few particularly circumstanced can be supposed to sympathize in this class i comprise occasional prolixity repetition and an eddying instead of progression of thought as instances see pages twenty seven twenty eight and sixty two of the poems volume one and the first eighty lines of the sixth book of the excursion fifth and last thoughts and images too great for the subject this is an approximation to what might be called mental bombast as distinguished from verbal for as in the latter there is a disproportion of the expressions to the thoughts so in this there is a disproportion of thought to the circumstance and occasion this by the by is a fault of which none but a man of genius is capable it is the awkwardness and strength of hercules with the distaff of omphala it is a well-known fact that bright colours in motion both make and leave the strongest impressions on the eye nothing is more likely too than that a vivid image or visual spectrum thus originated may become the link of association in recalling the feelings and images that had accompanied the original impression but if we describe this in such lines as they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude in what words shall we describe the joy of retrospection when the images and virtuous actions of a whole well-spent life pass before that conscience which is indeed the inward eye which is indeed the bliss of solitude assuredly we seem to sink most abruptly not to say burlesquely and almost as in a medley from this couplet to and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils volume one page three hundred and twenty eight the second instance is from volume two page twelve where the poet having gone out for a day's tour of pleasure meets early in the morning with a knot of gypsies who had pitched their blanket tents and straw beds together with their children and asses in some field by the roadside at the close of the day on his return our tourists found them in the same place twelve hours says he twelve hours twelve bounteous hours are gone while i have been a traveller under open sky much witnessing of change and cheer yet as i left i find them here whereat the poet without seeming to reflect that the poor tawny wanderers might probably have been tramping for weeks together through road and lane over moor and mountain and consequently must have been right glad to rest themselves their children and cattle for one whole day and overlooking the obvious truth that such repose might be quite as necessary for them as a walk of the same continuance was pleasing or healthful for the more fortunate poet expresses his indignation in a series of lines the diction and imagery of which would have been rather above than below the mark had they been applied to the immense empire of china in progressive for thirty centuries the weary sun betook himself to rest then issued vesper from the fulgent west outshining like a visible god the glorious path in which he trod and now ascending after one dark hour 
and one night's diminution of her power behold the mighty moon this way she looks as if at them but they regard not her o oh, better wrong and strife better vain deeds or evil than such life the silent heavens have goings on the stars have tasks but these have none the last instance of this defect for i know no other than these already cited is from the ode page three hundred and fifty one volume two where speaking of a child a six years darling of a pygmy size he thus addresses him thou best philosopher who yet dost keep thy heritage thou eye among the blind that deaf and silent reads the eternal deep haunted for ever by the eternal mind mighty prophet seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a present which is not to be put by now here not to stop at the daring spirit of metaphor which connects the epithets deaf and silent with the apostrophized eye or if we are to refer it to the preceding word philosopher the faulty and equivocal syntax of the passage and without examining the propriety of making a master brood o'er a slave or the day brood at all we will merely ask what does all this mean in what sense is a child of that age a philosopher in what sense does he read the eternal deep in what sense is he declared to be for ever haunted by the supreme being or so inspired as to deserve the splendid titles of a mighty prophet a blessed seer by reflection by knowledge by conscious intuition or by any form or modification of consciousness these would be tidings indeed but such as would presuppose an immediate revelation to the inspired communicator and require miracles to authenticate his inspiration children at this age give us no such information of themselves and at what time were we dipped in the lethe which has produced such utter oblivion of a state so godlike there are many of us that still possess some remembrances more or less distinct respecting themselves at six years old pity that the worthless straws only should float while treasures compared with which all the mines of golconda and mexico were but straws should be absorbed by some unknown gulf into some unknown abyss but if this be too wild and exorbitant to be suspected as having been the poet's meaning if these mysterious gifts faculties and operations are not accompanied with consciousness who else is conscious of them or how can it be called the child if it be no part of the child's conscious being for what i know the thinking spirit within me may be substantially one with the principle of life and of vital operation for what i know it might be employed as a secondary agent in the marvellous organization and organic movements of my body but surely it would be strange language to say that i construct my heart or that i propel the finer influences through my nerves or that i compress my brain and draw the curtains of sleep round my own eyes spinoza and bayman were on different systems both pantheists and among the ancients there were philosophers teachers of the en kai pan who not only taught that god was all but that this all constituted god yet not even these would confound the part as a part with the whole as the whole nay in no system is the distinction between the individual and god between the modification and the one only substance more sharply drawn than in that of spinoza jacobi indeed relates of lessing that after a conversation with him at the house of the poet gleim the tetes and anacreon of the german parnassus in which conversation lessing had avowed privately to jacobi his reluctance to admit any personal existence of the supreme being or the possibility of personality except in a finite intellect and while they were sitting at table a shower of rain came on unexpectedly gleim expressed his regret at the circumstance because they had meant to drink their wine in the garden upon which lessing in one of his half earnest half joking moods nodded to jacobi and said it is i perhaps that am doing that i e raining and jacobi answered or perhaps i gleim contented himself with staring at them both without asking for any explanation so with regard to this passage in what sense can the magnificent attributes above quoted be appropriated to a child which would not make them equally suitable to a bee or a dog or a field of corn or even to a ship or the wind and waves that propel it the omnipresent spirit works equally in them as in the child and the child is equally unconscious of it as they it cannot surely be that the four lines immediately following are to contain the explanation to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight of day or the warm light a place of thought where we in waiting lie surely it cannot be that this wonder rousing apostrophe is but a comment on the little poem we are seven that the whole meaning of the passage is reducible to the assertion that a child who by the by at six years old would have been better instructed in most christian families has no other notion of death than that of lying in a dark cold place and still i hope not as in a place of thought not the frightful notion of lying awake in his grave the analogy between death and sleep is too simple too natural to render so horrid a belief possible for children even had they not been in the habit as all christian children are 
of hearing the latter term used to express the former but if the child's belief be only that he is not dead but sleepeth wherein does it differ from that of his father and mother or any other adult and instructed person to form an idea of a thing's becoming nothing or if nothing becoming a thing it is impossible to all finite beings alike of whatever age and however educated or uneducated thus it is with splendid paradoxes in general if the words are taken in the common sense they convey an absurdity and if in contempt of dictionaries and custom they are so interpreted as to avoid the absurdity the meaning dwindles into some bold truism thus you must at once understand the words contrary to their common import in order to arrive at any sense and according to their common import if you are to receive from them any feeling of sublimity or admiration though the instances of this defect in mr wordsworth's poems are so few that for themselves it would have been scarcely just to attract the reader's attention toward them yet i have dwelt on it and perhaps the more for this very reason for being so very few they cannot sensibly detract from the reputation of an author who is even characterized by the number of profound truths in his writings which will stand the severest analysis and yet few as they are they are exactly those passages which his blind admirers would be most likely and best able to imitate but wordsworth where he is indeed wordsworth may be mimicked by copyists he may be plundered by plagiarists but he cannot be imitated except by those who are not born to be imitators for without his depth of feeling and his imaginative power his sense would want its vital warmth and peculiarity and without his strong sense his mysticism would become sickly mere fog and dimness to these defects which as appears by the extracts are only occasional i may oppose with far less fear of encountering the descent of any candid and intelligent reader the following for the most part correspondent excellences first an austere purity of language both grammatically and logically in short a perfect appropriateness of the words to the meaning of how high value i deem this and how particularly estimable i hold the example at the present day has been already stated and in part too the reasons on which i ground both the moral and intellectual importance of habituating ourselves to a strict accuracy of expression it is noticeable how limited an acquaintance with the masterpieces of art will suffice to form a correct and even a sensitive taste where none but masterpieces have been seen and admired while on the other hand the most correct notions and the widest acquaintance with the words of excellence of all ages and countries will not perfectly secure us against the contagious familiarity with the far more numerous offspring of tastelessness or of a perverted taste if this be the case as it notoriously is with the arts of music and painting much more difficult will it be to avoid the infection of multiplied and daily examples in the practice of an art which uses words and words only as its instruments in poetry in which every line every phrase may pass the ordeal of deliberation and deliberate choice it is possible and barely possible to attain that ultimatum which i have ventured to propose as the infallible test of a blameless style namely its untranslatableness in words of the same language without injury to the meaning be it observed however that i include in the meaning of a word not only its correspondent object but likewise all the associations which it recalls for language is framed to convey not the object alone but likewise the character mood and intentions of the person who is representing it in poetry it is practicable to preserve the diction uncorrupted by the affectations and misappropriations which promiscuous authorship and reading not promiscuous only because it is disproportionally most conversant with the compositions of the day have rendered general yet even to the poet composing in his own province it is an arduous work and as the result and pledge of a watchful good sense of fine and luminous distinction and of complete self-possession may justly claim all the honour which belongs to an attainment equally difficult and valuable and the more valuable for being rare it is at all times the proper food of the understanding but in an age of corrupt eloquence it is both food and antidote in prose i doubt whether it be even possible to preserve our style wholly unalloyed by the vicious phraseology which meets us everywhere from the sermon to the newspaper from the harangue of the legislator to the speech from the convivial chair announcing a toast or sentiment our chains rattle even while we are complaining of them the poems of boetius rise high in our estimation when we compare them with those of his contemporaries as sidonius apollinaris and others they might even be referred to a purer age but that the prose in which they are set as jewels in a crown of lead or iron betrays the true age of the writer much however may be effected by education i believe not only from grounds of reason but from having in great measure assured myself of the fact by actual though limited experience that to a youth led from his first boyhood to investigate the meaning of every word and the reason of its choice and position logic presents itself as an old acquaintance under new names on some future occasion more especially demanding such disquisition 
I shall attempt to prove the close connection between veracity and habits of mental accuracy, the beneficial after-effects of verbal precision in the preclusion of fanaticism, which masters the feelings more especially by indistinct watchwords, and to display the advantages which language alone, at least which language with incomparably greater ease and certainty than any other means, presents to the instructor, of impressing modes of intellectual energy so constantly, so imperceptibly, and as it were by such elements and atoms, as to secure in due time the formation of a second nature. When we reflect that the cultivation of the judgment is a positive command of the moral law, since the reason can give the principle alone, and the conscience bears witness only to the motive, while the application and effects must depend on the judgment, when we consider that the greater part of our success and comfort in life depends on distinguishing the similar from the same, that which is peculiar in each thing from that which it has in common with others, so as still to select the most probable, instead of the merely possible or positively unfit, we shall learn to value earnestly and with a practical seriousness a mean already prepared for us by nature and society, of teaching the young mind to think well and wisely, by the same unremembered process and with the same never-forgotten results, as those by which it is taught to speak and converse. Now how much warmer the interest is, how much more genial the feelings of reality and practicability, and thence how much stronger the impulses to imitation are, which a contemporary writer, and especially a contemporary poet, excites in youth and commencing manhood, has been treated of in the earlier pages of these sketches. I have only to add that all the praise which is due to the exertion of such influence for a purpose so important, joined with that which must be claimed for the infrequency of the same excellence in the same perfection, belongs in full right to Mr. Wordsworth. I am far, however, from denying that we have poets whose general style possesses the same excellence as Mr. Moore, Lord Byron, Mr. Bowles, and, in all his later and more important works, our laurel honouring laureate. But there are none in whose works I do not appear to myself to find more exceptions than in those of Wordsworth. Quotations or specimens would here be wholly out of place, and must be left for the critic who doubts and would invalidate the justice of this eulogy so applied. The second characteristic excellence of Mr. Wordsworth's work is, a correspondent weight and sanity of the thoughts and sentiments, one not from books, but from the poet's own meditative observation. They are fresh, and have the dew upon them. His muse, at least when in her strength of wing, and when she hovers aloft in her proper element, makes audible a linked lay of truth, of truth profound a sweet continuous lay, not learnt but native, her own natural notes. Even throughout his smaller poems, there is scarcely one which is not rendered valuable by some just and original reflection, ch twenty five volume two, or the two following passages in one of his humblest compositions. O reader, had you in your mind such stores a silent thought can bring, O gentle reader, you would find a tale in everything, and I've heard of hearts unkind, kind deeds with coldness still returning. Alas, the gratitude of men has oftener left me mourning. Or in a still higher strain, the six beautiful quatrains, page 134. Thus fares it still in our decay, and yet the wiser mind mourns less for what age takes away than what it leaves behind. The blackbird in the summer trees, the lark upon the hill, let loose their carols when they please, are quiet when they will. With nature never do they wage a foolish strife they see, a happy youth and their old age is beautiful and free but we are pressed by heavy laws and often glad no more we wear a face of joy because we have been glad of yore if there is one who need bemoan his kindred laid in earth the household hearts that were his own it is the man of mirth my days my friend are almost gone my life has been approved and many love me but by none am i enough beloved or the sonnet on bonaparte page two hundred and two volume two or finally for a volume would scarce suffice to exhaust the instances, the last stanza of the poem on the withered celandine, volume 2, page 312. To be a prodigal's favourite, then, worse truth, a miser's pensioner, behold our lot. O man, that from thy fair and shining youth, age might but take the things youth needed not. Both in respect of this and of the former excellence, Mr. Wordsworth strikingly resembles Samuel Daniel, one of the golden writers of our golden Elizabethan age, now most causelessly neglected. Samuel Daniel, whose diction bears no mark of time, no distinction of age which has been, and as long as our language shall last, will be so far the language of the to-day and for ever, as that it is more intelligible to us than the transitory fashions of our own particular age. A similar praise is due to his sentiments. No frequency of perusal can deprive them of their freshness. For though they are brought into the full daylight of every reader's comprehension, yet are they drawn up from depths which few in any age are privileged to visit, into which few in any age have courage or inclination to descend. If Mr. Wordsworth is not equally with Daniel alike intelligible to all readers of average understanding in all passages of his works, 
The comparative difficulty does not arise from the greater impurity of the ore, but from the nature and uses of the metal. A poem is not necessarily obscure because it does not aim to be popular. It is enough if a work be perspicuous to those for whom it is written, and fit audience find, though few. To the ode on the intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood, the poet might have prefixed the lines which Dante addresses to one of his own canzoni. Canzone i credo, che saranno radi color, che tua ragione intendan bene, tanto lo sei faticoso ed alto. O lyric song, there will be few, I think, who may thy import understand aright, thou art for them so arduous and so high. But the ode was intended for such readers only as had been accustomed to watch the flux and reflux of their inmost nature, to venture at times into the twilight realms of consciousness, and to feel a deep interest in modes of inmost being, to which they know that the attributes of time and space are inapplicable and alien, but which yet cannot be conveyed save in symbols of time and space. For such readers the sense is sufficiently plain, and they will be as little disposed to charge Mr. Wordsworth with believing the platonic pre-existence in the ordinary interpretation of the words, as I am to believe that Plato himself ever meant or taught it. Pola oi ut ancu nos, locea bellae, and don enti faretras, fonata sintoisin, es deto pan hermainon, chatisei, sophos, o pola edos fua, mathontes de labroi, panglossia, coraces os, acranta gareton, dios pros on nicha theon. Third, and wherein he soars far above Daniel, the sinewy strength and originality of single lines and paragraphs, the frequent curiosa felicitas of his diction, of which I need not here give specimens, having anticipated them in a preceding page. This beauty, and as eminently characteristic of Wordsworth's poetry, his rudest assailants have felt themselves compelled to acknowledge and admire. Fourth, the perfect truth of nature in his images and descriptions, as taken immediately from nature, and proving a long and genial intimacy with the very spirit which gives the physiognomic expression to all the works of nature. Like a green field reflected in a calm and perfectly transparent lake, the image is distinguished from the reality only by its greater softness and lustre. Like the moisture or the polish on a pebble, genius neither distorts nor false colours its objects, but on the contrary brings out many a vein and many a tint, which escape the eye of common observation, thus raising to the rank of gems what had been often kicked away by the hurrying foot of the traveller on the dusty high road of custom. Let me refer to the whole description of skating, volume 1, page 42 to 47, especially to the lines, So through the darkness and the cold we flew, and not a voice was idle, with the din, meanwhile the precipices rang aloud, the leafless trees and every icy crag tinkled like iron, while the distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound of melancholy not unnoticed, while the stars eastward were sparkling clear, and in the west the orange sky of evening died away, or to the poem on the green linnet, Volume 1, page 244. What can be more accurate, yet more lovely, than the two concluding stanzas? Upon yon tuft of hazel trees, that twinkle to the gusty breeze, behold him perched in ecstasies, yet seeming still to hover, there where the flutter of his wings, upon his back and body flings shadows and sunny glimmerings, that cover him all over. While thus before my eyes he gleams, a brother of the leaves he seems, when in a moment forth he teems, his little song in gushes, as if it pleased him to disdain and mock the form which he did feign while he was dancing with the train of leaves among the bushes or the description of the blue cap and of the noontide silence page two hundred and eighty four or the poem to the cuckoo page two hundred and ninety nine or lastly though i might multiply the references to ten times the number to the poem so completely wordsworth's commencing three years she grew in sun and shower fifth a meditative pathos a union of deep and subtle thought with sensibility a sympathy with man as man, the sympathy indeed of a contemplator, rather than a fellow-sufferer, or co-mate, spectator, out particeps, but of a contemplator, from whose view no difference of rank conceals the sameness of the nature, no injuries of wind or weather, or toil, or even of ignorance, wholly disguise the human face divine. The superscription and the image of the Creator still remain legible to him under the dark lines with which guilt or calamity had cancelled or cross-barred it. Here the man and the poet lose and find themselves in each other, the one as glorified, the latter as substantiated. In this mild and philosophic pathos, Wordsworth appears to me without a compeer. Such as he is, so he writes. See volume 1, page 134 to 136, or that most affecting composition, The Affliction of Margaret, of page 165 to 168, which no mother, and, if I may judge by my own experience, no parent can read without a tear. 
or turn to that genuine lyric in the former edition entitled the mad mother page hundred and seventy four to hundred and seventy eight of which i cannot refrain from quoting two of the stanzas both of them for their pathos and the former for the fine transition in the two concluding lines of the stanza so expressive of that deranged state in which from the increased sensibility the sufferer's attention is abruptly drawn off by every trifle and in the same instant plucked back again by the one despotic thought bringing home with it by the blending fusing power of imagination and passion the alien object to which it had been so abruptly diverted no longer an alien but an ally and an inmate suck little babe oh suck again it cools my blood it cools my brain thy lips i feel them baby they draw from my heart the pain away oh press me with thy little hand it loosens something at my chest about that tight and deadly band i feel thy little fingers pressed the breeze i see is in the tree it comes to cool my babe and me thy father cares not for my breast tis thine sweet baby there to rest tis all thine own and if its hue be change that was so fair to view tis fair enough for thee my dove my beauty little child is flown but thou wilt live with me in love and what if my poor cheek be brown tis well for me thou canst not see how pale and wan it else would be last and pre-eminently i challenge for this poet the gift of imagination in the highest and strictest sense of the word in the play of fancy wordsworth to my feelings is not always graceful and sometimes recondite the likeness is occasionally too strange or demands too peculiar a point of view or is such as appears the creature of predetermined research rather than spontaneous presentation indeed his fancy seldom displays itself as mere and unmodified fancy but in imaginative power he stands nearest of all modern writers to shakespeare and milton and yet in a kind perfectly unborrowed and his own to employ his own words which are at once an instance and an illustration he does indeed to all thoughts and to all objects add the gleam the light that never was on sea or land the consecration and the poet's dream i shall select a few examples as most obviously manifesting this faculty but if i should ever be fortunate enough to render my analysis of imagination its origin and characters thoroughly intelligible to the reader he will scarcely open on a page of this poet's works without recognising more or less the presence and the influences of this faculty from the poem on the yew trees volume one page three hundred and three three hundred and four but worthier still of note are those fraternal four of borrowdale joined in one solemn and capacious grove huge trunks and each particular trunk a growth of intertwisted fibrous serpentine upcoiling and inveterately convolved not uninformed with fantasy and looks that threaten the profane a pillared shade upon whose grassless floor of red-brown hue by sheddings from the pinal umbrage tinged perennially beneath whose sable roof of boughs as if of festal purpose decked with unrejoicing berries ghostly shapes may meet up noontide fear and trembling hope silence and foresight death the skeleton and time the shadow there to celebrate as in a natural temple scattered o'er with altars undisturbed of mossy stone united worship or in mute repose to lie and listen to the mountain flood murmuring from glasamara's inmost caves the effect of the old man's figure in the poem of resolution and independence volume two page thirty three while he was talking thus the lonely place the old man's shape and speech all troubled me in my mind's eye i seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually wandering about alone and silently or the eighth ninth nineteenth twenty sixth thirty first and thirty third in the collection of miscellaneous sonnets the sonnet on the subjugation of switzerland page two hundred and ten or the last ode from which i especially select the two following stanzas or paragraphs page three hundred and forty nine to three hundred and fifty our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us our life star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness but trailing clouds of glory do we come from god who is our home heaven lies about us in our infancy shades of the prison-house begin to close upon the growing boy but he beholds the light and whence it flows he sees it in his joy the youth who daily further from the east must travel still is nature's priest and by the vision splendid is on his way attended at length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day and page three hundred and fifty two to three hundred and fifty four of the same ode o oh, joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benedictions not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood whether busy or at rest with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise 
but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day and yet a master light of all our seeing uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truths that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore and since it would be unfair to conclude with an extract which though highly characteristic must yet from the nature of the thoughts and the subject be interesting or perhaps intelligible to but a limited number of readers i will add from the poet's last published work a passage equally wordsworthian of the beauty of which and of the imaginative power displayed therein there can be but one opinion and one feeling see white doe page five fast the churchyard fills anon look again and they all are gone the cluster round the porch and the folk who sat in the shade of the prior's oak and scarcely had they disappeared ere the prelusive hymn is heard with one consent the people rejoice filling the church with a lofty voice they sing a service which they feel for tis the sunrise now of zeal and faith and hope are in their prime in great eliza's golden time a moment ends the fervent din and all is hushed without and within for though the priest more tranquilly recites the holy liturgy the only voice which you can hear is the river murmuring near when soft the dusky trees between and down the path through the open green where is no living thing to be seen and through yon gateway where is found beneath the arch with ivy bound free entrance to the churchyard ground and right across the verdant sod towards the very house of god comes gliding in with lovely gleam comes gliding in serene and slow soft and silent as a dream a solitary doe white she is as lily of june and beauteous as the silver moon when out of sight the clouds are driven and she is left alone in heaven or like a ship some gentle day in sunshine sailing far away a glittering ship that hath the plain of ocean for her own domain what harmonious pensive changes wait upon her as she ranges round and through this pile of state overthrown and desolate now a step or two her way is through space of open day where the enamoured sunny light brightens her that was so bright now doth a delicate shadow fall falls upon her like a breath from some lofty arch or wall as she passes underneath the following analogy will i am apprehensive appear dim and fantastic but in reading bartram's travels i could not help transcribing the following lines as a sort of allegory or connected simile and metaphor of wordsworth's intellect and genius the soil is a deep rich dark mould on a deep stratum of tenacious clay and that on a foundation of rocks which often break through both strata lifting their backs above the surface the trees which chiefly grow here are the gigantic black oak magnolia grandiflora fraximus excelsior platane and a few stately tulip trees what mr wordsworth will produce it is not for me to prophesy but i could pronounce with the liveliest convictions what he is capable of producing it is the first genuine philosophic poem the preceding criticism will not i am aware avail to overcome the prejudices of those who have made it a business to attack and ridicule mr wordsworth's compositions truth and prudence might be imagined as concentric circles the poet may perhaps have passed beyond the latter but he has confined himself far within the bounds of the former in designating these critics as too petulant to be passive to a genuine poet and too feeble to grapple with him men of palsied imaginations in whose minds all healthy action is languid who therefore feed as the many direct them or with the many are greedy after vicious provocatives so much for the detractors from wordsworth's merits on the other hand much as i might wish for their fuller sympathy i dare not flatter myself that the freedom with which i have declared my opinions concerning both his theory and his defects most of which are more or less connected with his theory either as cause or effect will be satisfactory or pleasing to all the poets admirers and advocates more indiscriminate than mine their admiration may be deeper and more sincere it cannot be but i have advanced no opinion either for praise or censure other than as text introductory to the reasons which compel me to form it above all i was fully convinced that such a criticism was not only wanted but that if executed with adequate ability it must conduce in no mean degree to mr wordsworth's reputation his fame belongs to another age and can neither be accelerated nor retarded 
how small the proportion of the defects are to the beauties i have repeatedly declared and that no one of them originates in deficiency of poetic genius had they been more and greater i should still as a friend to his literary character in the present age consider an analytic display of them as pure gain if only it removed as surely to all reflecting minds even the foregoing analysis must have removed the strange mistakes so slightly grounded yet so widely and industriously propagated of mr wordsworth's turn for simplicity i am not half as much irritated by hearing his enemies abuse him for vulgarity of style subject and conception as i am disgusted with the gilded side of the same meaning as displayed by some affected admirers with whom he is forsooth a sweet simple poet and so natural that little master charles and his younger sister are so charmed with them that they play at goody blake or at johnny and betty foy were the collection of poems published with these biographical sketches important enough which i am not vain enough to believe to deserve such a distinction even as i have done so would i be done unto for more than eighteen months have the volume of poems entitled sibylline leaves and the present volume up to this page been printed and ready for publication but ere i speak of myself in the tones which are alone natural to me under the circumstances of late years i would fain present myself to the reader as i was in the first dawn of my literary life when hope grew round me like the climbing vine and fruits and foliage not my own seem mine for this purpose i have selected from the letters which i wrote home from germany those which appeared likely to be most interesting and at the same time most pertinent to the title of this work End of chapter twenty two